time we will go. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name's Jane, and I'm part of the Pest Odyssey Steering Group Committee. We're very pleased to have you with us today. Uh, one advantage of doing this virtually is that we can have many more of you with us. This year we have 300 instead of the usual 70 people. Uh, the larger numbers and getting to grips with the new technology, unfortunately, has led to an error. Uh, one batch of emails containing the link to this meeting was inadvertently sent with the addresses in the carbon copy line rather than the blind carbon copy line. Um, this was a genuine error and we apologise most sincerely for any distress this may have caused and for the data breach which has resulted. If you received that particular email, we'd ask you please to delete it immediately after this webinar and also to go into your um, actual trash and delete it from there so it's fully gone from your computer. And also that you don't attempt to contact any of the other addressees in that email. We really are very sorry for that error. So a few notes about this session. As there are so many of you in the webinar, which we're still astounded about, thank you all for coming, um, all the participants' videos and microphones are off. We're going to have two slots of three presentations with questions at the end of each group of three. And you can submit questions through the Q&A function, which you'll find in your uh, Zoom toolbar. You can do that at any point during the presentation, but do please indicate which speaker your question is aimed at. Um, if you're coming in later or while the questions are going on and it's for everyone, if you just say for all, that would be really helpful. As you have discovered already, the chat function is also available and do please use that for discussion. You will hear me give time checks to the speakers. Uh, we absolutely have to run to time as the Icon Zoom account is in use after us and we will get bumped off by Book and Paper Group. One of the other things you'll find in the Zoom toolbar is the polls button. There are two questions in that function which we would very much like you to answer during this afternoon. Um, I may have set it to anonymous, if not, I apologize, but we really will only be looking at the answers. We won't be paying any attention as to who said what. The session is being recorded and the link will be available by next week, uh, probably through the Pest Odyssey website and also the network page on the ICON website. And finally, please remember that all the presenters are relying on their home internet connections, which may be of slightly variable quality. Uh, please bear with us if there are IT issues. We are all doing our best. So I'm pleased to say we're now very slightly ahead. So I am delighted to welcome our first speaker for the afternoon, who is Adrian or A.D. Doyle, who is the IPM manager at the British Museum. And he is going to talk to us about a unique approach to IPM during lockdown. Thank you very much. It's all yours, A.D. So hopefully you have now got my PowerPoint on the screen. Yes. Is that correct? Indeed, yeah. Splendid, thank you very much. And welcome from Tracy Island. Um, what I'm going to do today is just to give you a little bit of a flavour of the kind of issues that we've been dealing with at the British Museum. Um, I'm not saying that we've got it right, I'm just saying I thought it would be useful that we would explain the kind of complexities we're dealing with and I'm very interested in if anybody has come up with a similar kind of thing. And also one of the things I'm, I'm considering is I think this would be something worth writing up. So if anybody wants to collaborate with me from another point of view, then, then please contact me. So my title of my paper is Unique Approach to IPM. Now, some of you may know the British Museum or you may know other places like Sourhead or Barnard Castle. Um, the British Museum obviously is in central London. It's in the um, middle of London, surrounded by buildings. And believe it or not, we actually have a, a lot of trees. So although you might consider that we don't actually have to worry from things like organic matter that comes through, the windows in actual fact we do and if you look at the image you can see that we're right on the corner of Russell Square 
which amongst other things has um, box tree moth problem and, and various other uh, environmental concerns. And the BM is actually on the Camden Council project looking at the environmental impact of, of uh, changes to uh, gardens and squares. One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about pr principally was what happened during lockdown and of course the immediate what was the range of activities that needed to be considered very very quickly and I've divided these up into three chunks and I'll just go through them. We chunked off gallery stores and offices with collections as one chunk if you like um, which is green. For orange, we put general back of house areas, meeting rooms and staff welfare, which is what I call common rooms or breakout spaces or indeed um, pop up cafes, which seem to appear in people's offices all over the place. Um, and then finally, for the other sort of status, if you like, I chose catering and events front of house and catering of events back of house. And we needed to understand fairly quickly at lockdown, what were the IPM implications of the situation that we were in at the point at which the museum was closed. Now, just to give you an example of galleries, um, those of you that know my work in IPM risk ratings, we have a high and medium and low risk, um, what I euphemistically call the munchability index. And what we have done with galleries, which was the first topic that we were looking at, is we've gone through all of the galleries of the museum and categorize them as high, medium and low. So if you look at the low bottom left gallery, that's gallery four, which is our Egyptian sculpture gallery. Um, there is no organic content in that gallery. So from an IPM point of view, it is very low risk. Top right is the Africa gallery, which contains a lot of um, open display organic material. And therefore, that would be a high IPM risk. And then finally, on bottom right on the screen, you will see um, one of our temporary exhibition galleries, which occasionally has high objects, uh, high munchability objects on display, but predominantly they are in showcases. But I would argue that the showcases are not particularly well sealed. So we call that medium. We then looked at stores and I've just put a few items of stores to give you some of the issues that we had to deal with. Um, looking at that again, were the stores we classified the stores as to low, medium and high. Now, a, a low um, risk, if you like, would be a store that contains plaster casts or sculpture or non-organic material. A store that was medium risk would possibly be something that was predominantly non-organic material, but also may contain a small amount of organic material that more often than not would be wrapped or protected by boxes or packaging. And then finally, a high risk uh, storage space but would be one where although we've got air conditioning we actually have um, highly munchable or category A objects on open racking or open shelving and in the event of an IPM uh, infestation if you like it could spread very quickly throughout the collections and then finally on the bottom right are those areas that we're all too familiar with in museums where you have lots of packing crates and um, who actually knows what's in the packing crates? It may well be that the packing crates are empty, but equally the packing crates may have a mixture of high, low or uh, medium risk objects. So it was a kind of a status check, if you like. And I put this up here just to give you an understanding of the concept. Um, we're, we're looking at health and safety risk matrices anyway, as part of the COVID-19 approach uh, with respect to staff working. And of course, when the public are able to come back. Um, so from this, I developed with colleagues in conservation and collections care, an IPM risk matrix. Before then, we actually had to sit down and work out what was our current status. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, but I think what I, I'll do is highlight a few things. Our initial statements and methodology were in fact a new risk assessment. At the point of lockdown, we had no major pest, pest issues that we were aware of so we were able to state what our current situation was. Secondly, we knew that our pest control company would still be prepared to come in subject to health and safety considerations. So they were uh, uh, in contract to come in one day a week rather than three days a week and there was a targeted approach as to what they were going to do. And similarly, our soft services and hard services companies 
were still going to come in and maintain air conditioning where we agreed it was going to be kept on and indeed continue cleaning. Um, I would add that obviously along with a lot of your organisations you would have subcontractor catering companies um, and one of the things that we worked with catering, our catering company, was to make sure that all their supplies and areas were locked down and made safe. Um, one of the things that obviously has come to light, which um, I didn't consider until fairly recently, is when we are working at the moment, welfare facilities may have to change depending on the nature of, of cleaning opportunities that we have, and there may be some cost, cost implications uh, on that. So bearing in mind what I've said earlier, those of you familiar with my work will know that I have what I call the Munchability Index. Um, and uh, this is already on the IPM database and we're color coding collections based on, are they high category A, in other words, they're highly vulnerable to insect damage. Are they category B, which means less vulnerable to insect damage, C or D, which means that on the scale of, of risk, they're very, very low. One of the things that we worked out fairly quickly was we didn't actually know where in the event of a salvage or a recovery situation, which collections we would be more concerned about. So on the IPM database, I've actually created a new row, uh, sorry, column, which we are populating with collections that we feel we need to be particularly aware of in the event that we might have another lockdown situation. It's also good for business recovery anyway so um, that's something that we've we think that you might find interesting the other thing i did was as i said i built an ipm risk assessment and just without going through all of the uh, columns if you look at the top row you'll see some preliminary information so which location uh, which site was it a gallery a store what sector because the museum is divided into um fire sectors and we thought that was a good approach which department do we have a concern about? And then we started to populate the um, database with where we thought we had some concerns. So if you look at the that column that I've highlighted, the organic store, which is in sector E, which belongs to the Middle East, is classified as a category A collection. It is environmentally monitored and has a humidifier. Now, when we actually looked at the rating, we worked out because of the nature of the collection and also the air conditioning was work, the initial rating became a M for medium, and therefore we realized that in actual fact it wasn't a priority. If you look at the second or third columns, perhaps the sorry, third row, um, the January 60 saw, we actually had um, a category A collection which we classified as high. Um, which is why it's red and from there we then said well what do we need to do to make sure that we're protecting the collections during lockdown so we created a subfolder which gives us an actions and undertaken to be reviewed column and just to give you an example there are two um, situations there where we had a, 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 a an office in one of our outstations where our um, contract uh, pest control company found webbing clothes moth and also one of my colleagues went in there and worked out that we actually had a problem. So you can see we've got an action required, which is to visit, identify source of the problem, uh, replace pest monitors. Who do we notify as to what the problem was? In other words, the head of department, the head of collections, the curator themselves, the, uh, the senior collections manager. And then under the undertaken folder uh, column, you can see what the activity was. And then the follow up was what will happen? And in other words, in this particular case, we're gonna go back in three months. These are some pictures just to give you an example of, of the kinds of things that, um, it's not a, a particular problem, don't get me wrong, but I mean, you can see the difference on the left image from the, the colleague of mine in, uh, in a particular department where we found the moth problem and then the area was reported by the pest control contractor the head of department and the curator confirmed that we could get into the store. The room was cleared, the carpet and the area were deep cleaned. And I'm going in next week to check the latest uh, pest monitors, the AF traps for webbing clothes moth to see whether it's made any difference. And what's happening is every month we are revising our category A high risk collection spaces that we've identified by our risk assessment 
to see whether or not we've been able to do anything to actually make things better. Now, I mean, I don't know, depending on your screen, how much you can see, but all I need you to concentrate on is that in the first row, in March to April, this particular store was high risk from the first circle. Because of various activities that we had undertaken and because of a review, by May, we had reduced the risk rating to medium. And as a result of a colleague of mine going in and checking the pest monitors and also work from the um, pest subcontractor, we then got some more information and we were able to reduce the risk rating to low. And then as you can see from the final two columns, we've got agreed actions during further occupancy and potential reserve return visit and check. And I will continue to do this every month. And this information is delivered to the head of conservation and collections care, and also the head of facilities management. Just to run through some of the other things that are going on is we continued periodic cleaning, um, but obviously that would be a lot less due to the number of cleaners that we had on site. Um, however, having said that, now that the public aren't actually in the gallery spaces, we have a greater opportunity to do deep cleaning that we wouldn't otherwise have had a chance to do. So that's been an advantage. But obviously the um, work that we wanted to be done had to tie in with what the soft services company could manage and where they thought their priorities were. So a series of action plans were rolled out which were signed off at a very high level to say this was an agreement with our soft services company and obviously with regard to access availability during lockdown. Just to run forward a little bit, um, those of you that work with mice might um, be aware, obviously, that organisations have uh, mice, but um, the work that we've been getting from our pest control company, Safeguard Pest Control, has clearly demonstrated that we have a lot less mice catches during lockdown, um, and uh, you can begin to work out all sorts of theories why that would be, not least of which we obviously don't have our catering outlets open at the moment, but the public aren't coming in and bringing their lunch and uh, putting crisp packets behind the back of showcases and all the wonderful things that we're usually familiar with. But what is interesting is that apart from less rodents than normal, the rodents are still populating and, and running around food serving and, and food consumption areas, even though there isn't food there. <clears throat> but also we've discovered that they, the rodents continue to behave in the same way. They're still being seen out of hours. So it's almost as though there's a phantom public that gets slung out at six o'clock um, and then the rodents are coming back. So they don't seem to have adapted to the lack of people. And from that point of view, although we've experimented with putting uh, rodent bait and glue boards out during the day, evening trapping is still the most effective. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, We've obviously had some uh, other issues. Um, we've had a bird, we called him Lockheed, I can't remember why. He was socially distancing from everyone else because he was right up uh, on high. Um, and then a couple of weeks ago, he, he gave birth to uh, a little one. So um, in a situation like that, this is where it's quite interesting because we don't have the people that normally patrol the building, this was found almost too late. And obviously because of the regulations, of the Wildlife and Countryside Act, we won't, we won't be allowed to move the nest until the bird has uh, fledged. But it, it, it's an interesting point that because we haven't got the eyes on the ground that certain things have escaped our attention. One of the other things that I've become very aware of is that we seem to have more environmental pests and now this might be something to do with the fact that air conditioning systems Five have been minutes. turned off and, all thanks, and also that uh, water flushing may not occur as often as we have expected. We've certainly found a lot more filter flies, um, forage flies that we would expect um, and so our contractors have gone in and had to deal with that. And finally just to wrap up obviously uh, uh, along with yourselves um, who work in other organisations it has been a unique opportunity to do some exterior work to the building including uh, groundworks, weeding and spraying paths. Um, Obviously, internally, we've had an opportunity without the public to do some very extensive deep cleaning in galleries and non-collection spaces, um, including exterior windows and floors. Um, the capital projects and contractual work opportunities have been really good. So huge amounts of work have been done on windows and doors and roof access. 
And finally, one of the things I've been quite pleased on from an IPM point of view, I've been able to do a couple of membership broadcasts. Um, I've done a member cast called Meeting the Mothman. We've been involved in some public relations and also um, done some work on IPM for the young members, uh, which has been really, really uh, an opportunity that otherwise I wouldn't have had the time for. So to summarize, and this is obviously very, very quick, from my point of view, it was an absolute shock when we had to close. Um, but from that, we have got some opportunities. It certainly gives us an opportunity to rethink on what we do when we return and it did make provision for if we have to lock down again. We've also had to learn to adapt very quickly and prepare for the future. And from this, we are now re-evaluating our risk assessments um, across the whole organization. And just to say thank you very much to my colleagues in Total Support Services, Safeguard Pest Control, my department, which is the Property and Facilities Management Department, and Conservation and Care and Access because without them, we wouldn't be in the current situation that we are. So I believe I've run out of time. Thank you very much for listening to me. Hopefully you found something that was useful and I gladly have some feedback from anybody who, who has had similar things to do or indeed has, has approached their organization in a different way. So um, I will now hand back to Jane. Wonderful. Thank you very much, AD. That was fascinating. Now, how do I unmute no, the thing the that power? says stop sharing? Stop sharing. Okay. This is where it becomes fun because I don't know how to do this. That's it. Perfect. And then just. Has it gone? Not yet. Can you do it for me? I don't know how to do it. Um, the options. There you go. You've gone. It's gone. So our next speaker this afternoon. Continuing the theme about IPM in lockdown is Karen Harris, who is conservation team leader at Historic Royal Palaces. <clears throat> and she's going to talk to us about IPM considerations when preparing for lockdown and beyond. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Jane. Today I'll be discussing the IPM considerations that Historic Royal Palaces have put in place when we were planning our approach to lockdown and beyond. I'm going to focus particularly on Hampton Court and Kew Palace, but we did use this approach for all of our six palace sites. So, both Hampton Court and Kew Palace are buildings which have a large number of collection items within their walls. Karen, you can't see your PowerPoint yet. Oh, oh, hold on. It's not giving me the option to share yet. Sorry. Right. Yes, there we go. Perfect. <clears throat> that okay? You see it now? Yep. yep. Perfect. There we go. Right. So, both Hampton Court and Kew Palace are buildings which have got a large number of collection items. You can see some of the examples here within their walls. These collections include a wide variety of objects and materials, including paintings, furniture, works of art, and significantly historic textiles. The environment within these rooms are relatively stable. And the collections are protected um, from extremes of fluctuations by both the building fabric and by a building management system of humidity controlled radiators. So in late February and early March, like most heritage organizations in the UK, we could see from the news how the COVID crisis was progressing and we were aware that some sort of lockdown looked like it would be inevitable. So in mid-March, when lockdown was confirmed we, and all the palaces were closed, we'd already begun to think about what this might mean for our sites and our collections. We were acutely aware of the potential risk of these collections from any insect pest activity during closures, particularly as they were on open display, our concerns were common clothes, moth and varied carpet beetle as we, along with many other historic properties in the southeast of England, find low numbers of these across our sites during a normal year. So lockdown couldn't have come at a better time for these carpet beetle and clothes moths. The weather was good, the temperature was rising, and the breeding season was about to begin. Prior to lockdown being enacted on the 23rd of March, we had the opportunity to look at our existing historic IPM data and to rapidly inspect as many of the more vulnerable pest collections at low level. 
We could also, with our registrar support, confirm if any of the loan agreements had specific IPM requirements that needed to be taken into account as part of their, our loan agreements. And we could buy a small amount of supplies that we might need, such as traps and vacuum bags, before the funds were frozen to keep us going for a little while, assuming that someone would be able to come on site to use them. So when the lockdown date was confirmed, we were in a relatively good place to identify what would be required to continue protecting the collections for the pandemic period with little or no conservation presence on site, including how to ensure insect pest activity could be kept to a minimum. From an IPM perspective, the previously collected pest data and the team's good working knowledge of both the building and the collections enabled us to see which objects and insect pests might cause us an issue if we were permitted little or no conservators on the site during the period. This information, we could see where we were likely to have activity and where it had been in previous years. The information also showed us that our main area of concern was our higher risk textile collections. And this risk was potentially from common clothes moth and very carpet beetle activity, as I've mentioned before. We could identify the specific objects and the areas that would need closer attention. And these were mostly areas where historic or known pest activity had occurred before. And this was particularly in our state rooms where our historic textiles were on open display. This would be the most vulnerable area. So from this, we developed a plan where we could visually inspect all of the traps within these target risk areas, brief, briefly looking at the traps for live activity, ideally once every one to two weeks. We could also inspect the pest risk vulnerable collection items within these display areas, particularly if they were low level activity had been seen before. If we found activity, we could isolate the object and treat to de-infest the object. We also specified that we would need each area to be vacuumed by a conservator, ideally again every one to two weeks to disrupt any potential activity. To carry out the inspections and cleaning for the initial lockdown period, we assessed that as a bare minimum, we could potentially make do with one person for one day a week at Hampton Court, and then one for one day a week at Kew. To put this into context, we do normally have three to four conservators on site carrying out preventive conservation tasks at any one time during a normal period. But regard regarding staff, we were all acutely aware that we needed to work to the government's guidelines for COVID-19, which rightly stated that only those carrying out essential work could come to work and they needed to travel by car, bike or walk. Public transport couldn't be used and anyone with an underlying health condition wouldn't be able to leave the house. So this automatically had the effect of reducing our pool of conservators who we could call upon in half. We also needed to be aware that having people on site might have an impact for others working, particularly security teams, and we didn't want to increase the risk of um, potential risk of transmission from the virus by having additional people. So we had to think really carefully about who we had and we settled on one. With this information, our head of department Add, could, by adding this to the wider conservation care requirements, then decide who we could ret retain to work to fulfil the essential conservation tasks during this period, looking at the revised regimes. So a business case was put forward for the collection care cover to be specifically minimal level conservation cleaning, not for presentation standards, simply for conservation standards, carrying out full IPM tasks, looking at environmental monitoring equipment and downloads for loans, condition checking con objects regularly but only in a cursory level and responding to any emergencies such as leaks. This business case included looking at staff resources to carry out the visits for the must do tasks which I've just mentioned and there was also we needed to ensure we had people to support other departments such as contract cleaners and maintenance and also ensure that their work was also going to be represented even at a minimal level to ensure everything was comprehensively covered. All the other tasks, back of house tasks such as dealing with loans and um, sorting out other discussions would be dealt with by a head of department. So having one person for one day a week per site would be challenging, but we felt it was the right response at the, initially while we were beginning to understand both the risks of the collection and potentially the risks of the virus better. This plan was agreed with a caveat that more conservators could be called upon should a collection risk emergency situation such as a flood or a fire or any widespread IPM issues arise. This information, this plan was incorporated within Historic Royal Palace's 
official standing orders, which specifies all aspects of how the palaces were to be managed and operated through the COVID crisis. And ours provided the conservation requirements. And here's a copy of ours. The slides is a little bit tricky to read, but the full document is available on the ICON website under the COVID response collection care group pages if you want to see them in more detail. For each site, this information from the standing order was translated into a checklist identifying the priority risks for each area based on the knowledge and the data that we had. These checklists considered all aspects of the agents to decay risks in the round, but highlighted each area, each risk separately to make the tasks which were needed to respond for these risks clearer. Here's a section of Hampton Court's checklist. IPM you can see is in the first column and it, it highlights all of the vulnerable objects and collection areas in the King's apartments. As we hadn't confirmed who would be carrying out the specific tasks at this stage, we decided we chose to lay everything out as clearly as possible, just in case somebody who was less familiar with the site or the collections was asked to come on site to carry them out. For this reason too, we also included floor plans for back of house areas and storage areas um, with, air with instructions of how to access them. So a pack was provided with all of this information. We of course worked with our health and safety team to confirm any risk assessments, changes needed to happen and staff procedures were in place for both coming on site during the COVID lockdown and for loan working as we would only have one person. And then we of course ensured that everyone who was asked to work on site was both familiar with these and comfortable to work to them. So once on site, we asked the team member to record both what work they'd completed and what they had found, such as IPM activity, water ingress, that kind of thing. These findings from the weekly inspections were inputted electronically into the spreadsheet, pre-prepared spreadsheet, and this would allow everybody involved to be able to keep track of who found what, by whom and where it was. And here you can see an example from Hampton from Q for the week of the 14th of April, where the, death, the known death watch beetle population had begun to emerge in the attics. Staying with Q, we were fortunate in many ways that here we hadn't woken up the palace yet. And for those who don't know, Q Palace is our only site where we close from October to March in the normal year and put everything to bed. So you can see images here of the bedrooms being put to bed. Last October, all of the objects were deep cleaned and um, covered with either a Tyvek and scoured calico and acid-free tissue. The fact that everything was covered was a mixed <coughs> blessing for us, as although the covers protected the objects, of course, from dust, light, and to a degree, environmental changes, they did have the potential to hide any insect activity. But removing them would um, add to the additional resources, um, which, when we didn't have a huge amount of people coming on site. But we agreed, of course, that we needed to remove them and then we could reinstate them as necessary after we'd carried out our IPM inspections and object cleaning. Although this did take additional time, it was the only way we could be confident that the object was clear of insect activity. At Hampton Court, um, this being closed also provided us with an opportunity to protect the displays in a different way. We adopted a similar approach to the put to bed of the objects at Kew. And here you can see one of the staterooms at Hampton Court where the low-level objects have been covered with acid-free tissue to protect against light and dust. We took the opportunity too to relocate the traps to, a, to less hidden locations, close to the original location so we didn't skew the data, but more easy to get to. And this was an important time-saving action as somebody would need to visually check these traps every week or so, and we do have over 100 traps at Hampton Court. So during the first couple of weeks of lockdown, the main challenges we found was increased dust levels, interestingly, within the display areas. And this dust was much finer than we would normally find when we were open to the public. And we needed to ensure that we could prevent the dust from continuing and settling and creating a potential food source for insect pests. It's still not clear to us what caused the dust, but we have continued our dust monitoring throughout the closures. So once we're back on site, we'll be able to look at, investigate the type and the disruption of the dust distribution so that we can potentially see what caused it, help us understand it better. But in the meantime, to deal with the immediate issue, we had to request an increase in the amount of time the contract cleaners could spend vacuuming the visitor traffic carpets within the display rooms. And here's some examples of our visitor traffic carpets. We have hundreds of meters of these throughout the display rooms. This increase in cleaning equated to an additional one hour a day. Like us, the contract cleaners had been reduced to a bare minimum. So this request required their manager's directorial approval as the extra, extra cost um, before it was an extra cost item before it could be confirmed. But this additional cleaning was vital to us because it was the only way to guarantee that there wasn't going to be any IPM issues with these carpets, which there have been in the past. 
Like many aspects of preventive conservation, this vacuuming also, of course, had the dual effect of decreasing dust levels within the rooms and also decreasing the potential risk caused by the dust sitting on objects, for particularly objects that we haven't been able to cover. This increase in fine dust, in fact, led us to the decision to cover the smaller, lower objects that you can see in this previous slide. But again, it was an additional resource. So another IPM challenge we had was from pigeons, similar to AD. Without visitors to disturb them, we had a significant increase in pigeon activity within the courtyards and the stairwells at Hampton Court. And here's some beautiful photographs of various examples of guano around the courtyards. This increase in pest control measured, it was, measures were required to manage the situation. But again, costs to address it needed to be approved from directorial level because, because of our lack of revenue at the moment. We could comfortably explain why these funds were needed as the nests, the debris, the guano from birds would create a variety of conservation challenges. There was an increased risk that if a door had been left open accidentally the bird would, could enter a display room which would be a much worse situation for all of us. The pest control contractors came on site and um, dealt with the pigeon issue and then contract cleaners following conservation guidelines removed the guano from the historic stone. And now we're looking at pigeon netting being commissioned and fitted to areas where we can feasibly safely do this. It was also, of course, reiterated to the small number of people on site why it's important to keep doors closed, even when we're closed to the public. So as lockdown moved into its third week in mid-April, with no press prospect of it coming to an end soon, we took the opportunity to, to review how we dealt with our preventive conservation work. It was at this point too that all the preventive conservators who'd been working from home were put on furlough, myself included, as this was a way to re further reduce payroll costs to support the long-term survival of the organisation. During these first three weeks, we found that our on-site presence brilliantly hadn't caused any challenges for other teams and social distancing could be safely maintained. We, were, we did, however, find that the large amount of work that the conservator had to deliver one day a week per site was challenging. So with the agreement of our head of department and those carrying out the work, we were able to, to increase the on-site presence at Hampton Court specifically to a maximum of four days a week. Sometimes it was more, sometimes it went up to five, but the average was four days a week. This was still much lower cover than we would normally have, but it did allow the person on site to inspect the backlog of pest traps that we had and then record this data into, um, for future reference into our database. It also allowed them to carry out more in-depth cleaning and then minimal inspection of the vulnerable collection areas to continue this and to carry this out in a much more um, progressive manner. And this was increasingly important as the breeding season progressed. This extra time also allowed us to continue with some of our Five important, minutes. less urgent, thanks Jane, less urgent tasks such as our IPM tasks. So one of these projects was just as lockdown was coming into place, we'd begun a piece of work where we were beginning to inspect and repack and freeze some of the textile objects that had arrived at Hampton Court from our other sites. This inspection was being, re was being done as a precautionary measure because they'd come from a collection store where we had historic low-level carpal beetle activity. The sealed box objects were still sitting within our quarantine room waiting for attention and now that we could have a little bit more time on site, the conservator could open, inspect and treat any potentially infested objects that showed sign of activity. Most of this could be done by one person, but moving the objects that were boxed from one location to another did require an extra pair of hands. The boxes were helpfully two metres long, so they could be moved whilst maintaining social distance. And here you can see all hands on deck are Palace Director, Head of Hampton Court and some of our Royal Collection colleagues helping move the boxes in a socially distance safe way. So in conclusion, the story so far. Well, the small amount of team of non-furloughed staff are still on site working on a rotor system and still carrying out essential IPM priorities, along with all of the other collection care tasks I've previously mentioned. And this looks like it will remain the same this way until the 31st of October. Many of the processes have been photographed brilliantly while this um, work is under going so that we've got a record of it for the future and many of the images you've seen have been taken by my colleague Laurie Gibbs who's been brilliantly taking pictures for us to document it during this strange time for all of us for those of us who haven't been able to see it. We're now getting ready to reopen to visitors parts of the interior of Hampton Court on the 17th of July so next week and this will help us 
to help us prepare for this, we've had a slight increase in people for a fixed term of eight days, so an extra person for eight days, to help carrying out socially distanced high-level IPM inspections of tapestries and deep cleaning of display rooms before we open to the public, because access will be trickier once we're open. Q Palace will remain closed until spring of next year. So we, these weekly inspections and cleaning that I've mentioned before will continue in the same way. We don't see a huge amount changing there. The main thing that has helped us to prepare for this lockdown has been the comprehensive site-specific IPM data, which has now at Hampton Court been going back for almost 20 years. And this coupled with a good understanding of the collection. This combination has proved invaluable to ensure that the highly vulnerable objects could be identified early, inspected and um, treated if necessary. These priorities and the collection care checklists have evolved as time progresses of course. Dust levels have returned to the lower levels whilst the palace has remained closed but this will no doubt increase again when we open our doors to the public next week. Uh, so at Hampton Court particularly vacuum will, vacuuming will become even more vital to keep on top of any potential IPM issues. IPM inspections will continue and the pest trap data um, will be recorded to so that we can use it in the future. The pest traps will be hidden again so that they're not either seen or touched by visitors. And we're lucky we haven't seen any significant IPM issues across our properties whilst we've been closed other than the annual influx of ladybirds at Hampton Court that we always get which is great news and this has largely been due to the hard work of the people working on site and continuing to carry out the important conservation and cleaning inspection without pause whilst we've been closed. So it's a big thank you to them. That's me done, Jane. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Karen. There you go. <coughs> You're not sharing. <laughs> so our next speaker is Helen Smith. He was an independent preventive conservator. And um, Helen is going to talk to us about IPM opportunities and challenges during lockdown. Helen, you may be glad to know that uh, Aidy and Karen have gone very slightly behind time. So if you want that extra two minutes, you've got them. <laughs> oh, thank you guys. Right, let's see if I can. Can you see my screen? Yeah. It's not the Come on. There we go. Right, hello. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm a preventive conservator. From 2011 to 2019, I was a preventive conservator for Tate. In fact, I was actually the very first um, dedicated preventive conservator for Tate. And although I've now left my permanent position there, I have been continuing to work with Tate's conservation science and preventive conservation team as a freelance contractor. I've particularly been able to assist during the COVID-19 lockdown, where due to a recruitment freeze and the effects of the pandemic, the team wasn't always at full capacity. So as many of you know already, Tate has four gallery sites and two stores. The galleries are Tate Breton and Tate Modern in London, Tate St Ives together with the Barbara Hepworth Museum and Garden um, in St Ives, and Tate Liverpool. Uh, Tate also has a London art store and a country art store. As we've only got quite limited time today, I'm going to talk to you about IPM on site at Tate Britain, Tate Modern and Tate Store Southwark today, so the London sites. And forgive me, I'm dual purposing here so I can read my notes. So on the 17th of March 2020, Tate closed all four of its galleries to visitors in line with advice from Public Health England. Within 48 hours the offices were closed and on Monday the 22nd the government took the country into full lockdown and all sites were closed to almost all staff in line with government advice. Initially the hope was to reopen in May, however as we know the lockdown lasted far longer than we at first hoped. With the lifting of the pandemic restrictions now allowing museums and galleries to reopen, Tate has announced that all four galleries will reopen to visitors from the 27th of July. At the point of closure, Tate's business continuity plan or BCP was already in motion, with senior managers and teams on the ground working hard to ensure a smooth closure for what was initially expected to be a few weeks. Conservation measures are only one aspect of the BCP, which gives a roadmap for how the whole organisation will respond to various types of threat, fire, flood, um, terrorism, and of course, public health issues such as this current pandemic. Um, security, some key operational and cleaning staff remained working on site throughout the lockdown, but permission was required for access by any other staff needing to travel to any of the galleries for essential work purposes. In the initial weeks, only staff listed on the BCP were allowed access. 
The preventive conservation team, including myself, worked together remotely in those first weeks to prioritise aspects of preventive conservation during lockdown. IPM was considered alongside environmental monitoring and control. As a result, we undertook targeted preventive conservation site visits during the closure period to complete specific tasks which were not possible remotely. At the same time as our work, Tate Estates and operational teams planned and provided vital services throughout the closure period. These included deep additional cleaning of voids and spaces which are often hard to schedule around the busy exhibition and display programme, as well as um, and in addition to the extensive COVID-19 related deep cleaning throughout the galleries, offices and back of house spaces. In April, Tate's new full-time preventive conservator, Mark Miller, joined the team remotely. Mark and I undertook the IPM focus site visits together in May and June. This serendipitously provided a handover opportunity which may or may not have otherwise existed. So before I talk about what we did during lockdown, I'll briefly mention the type of IPM activities which were happening across Tate during more normal times. I have spoken to this group before a few years ago about the impossibility of an effective object quarantine process at Tate um, for artworks going on display in the galleries. At Tate sites, artworks move between sites, within sites and beyond our own estates all the time. And there's a very large international loan programme as well. The timing um, of these does not accommodate a routine isolation of artworks between venues. It's also very difficult to undertake routine uh, pest monitoring in the gallery spaces. Um, aesthetic considerations aren't insignificant in a white cube type gallery and the duration of exhibitions and, dis and displays precludes the use of a standard quarterly monitoring programme in any of the front, um, front of house areas. So um, exhibitions may last three to six months and displays may last from a few months up to um, a couple of years. Um, exhibition specific insect pest monitoring is discussed and agreed in advance for exhibitions with highly vulnerable artworks. Um, and the preventive conservators work closely with the specialist object conservators to identify incoming works that require treatment in, in advance um, or quarantine before coming on site um, and also close inspection um, when they arrive on site. The preventive conservation team has offered basic IPM awareness training to conservators and art handlers over the years and for many incoming artworks um, the on, the on arrival condition report is quite sufficient to flag up any potential live pest issues and treat them from there. For all these reasons, I had um, chosen in my time at Tate to use a version of IPM risk zones at Tate, similar to what AD was talking about. So routine monitoring, building up a picture over time of insect pest populations and distribution is possible in the stores, art handling areas, conservation studios and the library and archive. Um, I've mentioned there, uh, uh, the IPM Champions, that's a pilot project um, involving a lot of training of the library and archive team in order to be able to assist with the IPM activities. <clears throat> a more bespoke approach is taken to IPM in the gallery zones, specific to the artworks on display, the time of year and other factors. So with the gallery suddenly closed, some unprecedented opportunities presented themselves for, um, within our IPM sphere, and I'll get to those shortly. That and that, right. So what are the pest risks for Tate? Well, pest issues can come either from the building or into the collection or be imported via specific items. So pests within the building, um, as we know, almost every building, not just Tate buildings, almost every building has some um, residential insect pests. And we also know that finding only one or two pests is not an infestation make. Problems arise largely when the pests move from the building into the collections. And excellent housekeeping is the best and most cost effective way to prevent infestations. Tate has used industrial buildings to house art museums and sometimes the architecture itself can prove challenges to this excellent housekeeping. The air conditioning duct ductwork terminates in floor grills in many of the galleries. These provide natural sinks for dust and debris to fall into and they are also connected to the rest of the ductwork and therefore are a potential route for pests to travel through the building. One of the potentially most beneficial actions during closure has been to plan for a deep clean under and inside all the ventilation grills, some of which are very hard to get to when we're in our normal opening time. Some of them are behind ropes and occasionally you have plinths that are placed partially over um, grills. So that there's been quite a lot of planning going on behind the scenes to enable that to be done before we reopen. So within the collection, um, so Tate's collection covers art from the 16th century to the present day and from an insect's viewpoint many of the tastier artworks are from the 20th and 21st centuries. 
artists often choose unconventional materials or simply media which is attractive to certain species of insects. In March 2020, serendipitously, it turned out there were actually relatively few of the highest risk artworks actually out on open display. This made our inspections on site significantly simpler than they may have been if the lockdown had happened at a different time. Before our visits, we consulted with the specialist conservation teams to ask them to identify vulnerable works that they wanted us to look at. We focused our close inspection on these artworks, but we did actually walk the entire gallery space of both Tate Brutton and Tate Modern, and we inspected any additional artworks that we felt from our knowledge and experience may also be vulnerable to pests. Uh, there we go. Um, and what pests do we actually find at Tate? So generally in the buildings, the usual, the usual culprits are present. We have Tineola biseliella, um, the web enclosed moth. We get Atagenus smyrnavi, the vodka or brown carpet beetle, and we get various Anthrenus carpet beetles along with the odd silverfish or three. Um, in common with many places, um, the web enclosed moth is our current biggest challenge in terms of resident populations in our buildings. Occasionally, we do have more exotic visitors who hitch a ride from other places. These tend to be isolated cases associated with specific incoming artworks or materials. They are spotted and physically isolated on arrival as part of the object condition check. So Mark and I were not really anticipating finding any of these more unusual pests in the galleries during lockdown and we were very pleased to find that this was not that this was also the case. There weren't any. Um, although during our inspection visits we did look out for any signs of emerging adults of any species. One of the reasons we timed our visits to the end of May the beginning of June was to try and coincide with the beginning of um, woodborer beetle emergence season because we were limited on the number of visits that we could actually do. Okay. So initially of course we all expected the lockdown to be shorter than it was. This was how the performance artwork in the Blavatnik building at Tate Modern, A Life in Black and White, was optimistically left at the end of March. Um, and then shortly after lockdown, the expectation was extended to reopening in June and then July and beyond. And now we have a, an opening date at the end of July. So at the beginning, if the galleries were to be reopened with only a few weeks, our priorities for parental conservation focus were firmly on ensuring our remote environmental monitoring systems were fully functional. We've recently moved to Testo Wi-Fi environmental monitoring across all of our sites, and we needed to make sure that batteries were working and that the loggers were where they needed to be. As the lockdown extended, IPM became a higher priority for our time. Um, and this is where we identified the end of May and the beginning of June as the most efficient time to have these single focused IPM visits. What was different in the galleries when we closed down was that they overnight became more like stores than they were like public spaces. And what I mean by this is that lighting levels were reduced, there were almost no people in the spaces, by and large the environments became more stable. Um, and in these stores, um, Although they were acting like stores, some artworks were on open display, and of these, some were made of materials attractive to insect pests. In particular, the lifestyle of the common clothes moth, shunning the light and disliking being disturbed, meant that the risk of problems from moths in the building coming in, out and into the artworks on display was higher um, and rising during the closed period than when the galleries are open. So Mark and I visited Tate Modern, Tate Britain and Tate Store Southwark with an IPM focus and we had one full day on each site and we covered all the spaces with artworks in on each of those days so it was quite a heavy duty day. At Tate Store, quarterly insect, in, uh, sorry, at Tate Store, quarterly insect <laughs> monitoring already takes place. During our visit we collected and replaced all the blunder traps, did a visual check for any unexpected activity in the stores. We placed fresh Tineola biseliella um, pheromone monitors in their usual places and noted areas that would benefit from an enhanced cleaning focus. The visit to store was not so very different to a normal visit. The quarterly monitoring programme at our country store had actually just been completed prior to lockdown in March and therefore we agreed that although the next visit would normally be scheduled for June, this could wait until July or even the beginning of August. At Tate Britain, we wanted to take advantage of the lack of visitors to try and answer some existing queries about insect populations in the building. As you saw, many galleries have some kind of um, floor or skirting level air vents. Working with the cleaners, a plan was being created to do clean with all, within all the grills before opening. And because we normally rely on insect sightings being reported through um, a form that's on our intranet, uh, rather than through monitor um, trap catcher, we felt that here was an ideal opportunity to supplement our knowledge with some additional targeted monitoring. 
and at Tate Modern, we focused more on specific artworks on open display. We closely inspected them and added blunder or pheromone monitors in targeted locations. Some of the challenges we encountered were ones we were expecting, but some took us a little by surprise. There were a lot of practical logistical challenges in simply, simply accessing the galleries. Um, and that was because of the, um, the BCP measures that were in place. So key fobs have been deactivated for all staff for the duration of lockdown. Um, and in some areas, even where we were appointed to have a day pass fob, we still needed to have keys. And sometimes we needed to be accompanied by security, which then obviously had knock on effects for how we could manage the social distancing that was required. Gallery lighting systems are generally not, um, not designed to make it easy to switch them on and off at short notice. Normal lighting protocols have been superseded by lockdown protocols to ensure that gallery lighting wasn't accidentally left on when it should be off. Because of this, in some areas and on some days, we had to conduct our pest inspections by torchlight. Obviously, this is not ideal, uh, but we had a variety of bright handheld and head mounted LED torches between us. We were limited to the resources we had with us at each site. We planned our, visit our visits to start with Tate Britain, partly um, so that we could take a stock of materials and equipment with us from there to the other sites. Fortunately, with the lockdown coming at the end of March, the team had just made a substantial order of pest monitoring supplies. Hence, we had enough um, monitors that, um, to cover all of our high priority locations. Um, Sorry. And on top of course, and then, oh, sorry. And on top of the practical issues, we had to be extremely mindful of the reasons why the galleries were closed in the first place. COVID nineteen. This affected the choice of team members able to safely get to site and how we worked together in the buildings. We had to consider how we would get to and from the galleries. Who was able to do so without an unacceptable level of risk? As a car owner and driver, I was easily able to get to the London sites without needing to use public transport and with almost no, no staff on site, I was easily able to secure a parking spot, even at Tate Modern, for each visit. As I'm self-employed, I have responsibility for my own health and safety risk assessments, but I must also take into account uh, my clients, which in this case obviously is Tate, and their own COVID-19 risk assessment protocols. Mark and I discussed in advance and agreed um, the risk mitigation measures that we would be taking in line with the government advice, which changed throughout the time that we were planning and between visits. At the time of our visits, we weren't actually using face coverings, but we were socially distancing and frequently washing hands and we did not share equipment. That proved logistically quite challenging at times. Um, as Tate's beginning to reopen to all staff, staff are actually having to sign um, to say that they have read and understood Tate's COVID-9 risk assessments and they're being supplied with good levels of PPE to carry on working. Um, when we were there, it was just the two of us. So this is an example of one of the vulnerable artworks that we inspected during our visits. This is by Janice Kunelis. Um, it's two upright wooden posts that hold crossbars loosely wrapped with wool. And this is a, an artwork that we knew um, we have spotted moths on it occasionally in the past. And so we wanted to make sure we had a good look at it. We were really pleased to find that there was no additional evidence of any activity anywhere near this artwork. And, thank you. And we also laid extra uh, pheromone traps um, directly in the gallery, which is something we couldn't do if we were open uh, because they would be either disturbed or they wouldn't be uh, visually acceptable. Now this is Mark <laughs> in the glooming. Um, so we had the luxury of gallery lighting in some places, but as I said, sometimes we didn't and we had to work by torchlight. Um, so this is a photograph of Mark uh, laying, um, I think it's a pheromone monitor somewhere at Tate Britain where this particular gallery suite, we were not able to get the gallery lights switched on for our visit. So at Tate Britain, there was a very specific thing that I wanted to do when we had access to the site. Um, there was a particular gallery, the 1960 gallery, where we knew that there had been um, a particularly high level of moths spotted. Um, the artworks in the gallery are not particularly vulnerable to moth attack, but it was noticeable that moths were being seen. And last year, um, at the end of April, we had run an overnight pheromone um, monitoring regime, just over 12 to 15 hours. And on the left hand side of your screen, the, um, the many, many red dots show where we'd laid um, AF diamond traps overnight and gained a map of what was going on in that gallery. So I wanted to repeat that, given that we were now closed to visitors and the circles show where we actually decided to lay pheromones this time round, and they've been down now for three weeks. Um, and I think they've, uh, they're just being collected this week as staff start to go back on site. So we extended the range of our uh, monitoring to the adjacent galleries 
so we didn't have quite as many in the space. Um, but we're hoping that this will give us a very good idea of where in the room in the ductwork the problems occur. And this has also happened just before the deep cleaning that's been planned. So we're hoping that after the deep cleaning we can repeat the monitoring exercise and hopefully have a much, much lower level of moth um, to see. Right, so this is the final case study to show you. So this is um, Tamara Henderson's of Season's End. Um, and this was one of the works that was flagged up for us to have a look at. Um, it's made of textiles, paintings, and there's a film. Um, there was absolutely no insect evidence found on the sculptures themselves, which we were really, really pleased about. However, the curtains, so at the back of that picture, what you can see is floor to ceiling, black curtains. Um, and they are enclosing the film projector area. So the film is being shown in this little artificially created room made out of curtains. And it turns out that those curtains are made of felt and the felt was very definitely attractive to Tiniola um, to the extent that when I walked into that room, I was surrounded, well, not surrounded, I saw live moths fl flying around. So on discovering this particular problem, we laid five pheromone monitors with the dual purpose of learning more about the population density and the handy side effect of removing some of the adult males from the population because we were very limited on time as to what we could do on site. Um, this was followed up by a report back to the conservation managers with recommendations to remove the curtains or to treat them in situ, um, possibly with constraint until the installation is able to be removed later in the year. We also made the very clear recommendation that when those curtains are taken down, they must be double wrapped and completely sealed before they're carried through the gallery space, because what we don't want to do is move the problem from one gallery space to the next. So this is what it looks like inside the curtain space. Um, quite a haven for clothes moths. It's dark, it's undisturbed, um, providing a massive food and harbourage source in the form of curtains. And I think because this is part of the artwork, this was not on the general cleaning um, schedule for the cleaners. So we flagged that up as an area that needed deeper cleaning. The moths most likely originated in the floor grills and were attracted to the curtains as being a tastier food source than the dust bunnies in the grills. So this is where we put the traps out and then on the side you can just see um, the kind of um, catch that we were finding after three weeks. So not horrendous but they were definitely on all five traps there was a similar level of, of moth activity found in the boys. So um, now, with the long-awaited reopening dates announced, the IPM focus changes once more. As staff gradually return to site and to working in the galleries, our focus is now on communicating what we've done, including where the monitors are located so that we don't accidentally lose all that precious data before Mark or Rian, who's the assistant preventive conservator, are able to get on site to retrieve them. Um, from that data, a report will be produced and used to inform ongoing IPM tasks at each of the London sites. And that concludes my talk and also my contract type with tape for the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Helen. <clears throat> Pretty much spot on time as well, so thank you. So um, now we have some time for some questions. So I will hand over to, come on. Mel Houston, who's also part of the steering group, who will um, Karen, who will ask the questions and um, there we go. Right, hi Jane, thank you very much. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. We've had uh, a good number of really good questions, some to specific speakers. And some I think we, we could ask everybody to chip in. Um, not that I'm biased, but the first question did come from a conservator working up here in Scotland, uh, Ilsa Murray, hello Ilsa, um, who's pointing out that they're beginning to open up a number of properties up here and there's been instances of pigeon activity with uh, guano on paved surfaces, stone, wood, and this is really, first of all, to Edie, um, about whether um, is there any sort of information about whether there is uh, the best way to clean off is either using water or, or enzymic cleaners for removal, um, and what are the, the panellists' thoughts on 
that of removing guano and any sort of experience you've had? Well, sure. um, from the British Museum point of view, we obviously we're a listed building. Um, we can't afford to damage the uh, stone or fabric of the building in any way. So um, also part of the contract we have with our subsurfaces, our, our soft surfaces contract, is wherever possible we're using environmentally friendly product. Um, my gut feeling at the moment would be to try and use just water, jet wash very slightly before you use any um, abrasive or chemical treatments. But I would always prefer to use a non-enzymic non thing if ever possible. I don't know, Karen, you have any thoughts on that as well for Ailsa? I, I would agree with AD. I mean, because we're a scheduled monument at Hampton Court, we would go for the, the most gentle method possible. And on the historic stonework, we'd try with just water, first of all, and then with a kind of low level gentle detergent, a mild detergent. Um, that, of course, is reliant on the fact that you can remove it fairly quickly from when it is kind of found there. If it becomes more ingrained, then you may need to start looking at some more slightly more robust methods. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question also for Edie, and this was one no. yeah, well, sure. Sorry, Jill, I meant just to make a warning comment that there's a very serious health risk from yeah. Bergulano and nobody who is not well protected or actually a professional cleaner should attempt to do it on their own. It's very, very hazardous. Okay, thank you. Yep, I, I would agree with that. We, we tend to use um, the system, if it's our contract cleaners, they would use the same PPE they would use for bodily fluids cleaning. <coughs> the training for that. Very good, thank you. Um, moving on again, uh, another question for Edie um, from Christian. I think you've, you've chatted to him offline about this, but just looking at your rodent data, and you were saying you were noticing um, sort of lower levels than pre-lockdown and, and Christian was just asking you about how you've looked at those figures or is there ongoing analysis for that? Um, well it's, it, it's actually quite problematic so I'm a bit mean by saying the levels are quite low. What we've done for example the Great Core which those of you may know is, 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 is sort of a big open space. We've done a lot of pest proofing actually just before lockdown and during um, but what we have noticed is without the catering outlets open in the Great Court at the moment, we're actually not getting the rodent population inside. The other, the other thing that's been quite interesting is normal external routes to the building, which are normally open, in other words, you know, to the west roadway, the east roadway, or the back or whatever it is, those doors are normally on magna locks. Now, in the event of a fire emergency, the magna locks close down and the doors close because obviously that creates your fire compartmentalization. But as a rule of thumb, the doors are used to create airflow and also to allow people to move around because the exterior of the building is closed. We're not actually getting the mice into the building as well. So it's actually twofold. The mice are not physically coming in the building because the perimeter of the building is locked, but also from within, we're actually getting less mice populations. What we have done is we plot this all on, on scatter graphs and um, floor plans so we know where our mouse hotspots are. Um, and um, this is a bigger piece of work that we're doing with the company to see what percentage of effectiveness has been our increased proofing and actually what percentage of change is as a result of lack of activity for one of the better ways. Okay, thank you. Just moving on because we've got quite a few other questions. Uh, one for Karen here from Victoria Stevens um, about would you be able to send the link for the HRP document because um, she's having a bit of trouble finding on the ICON coronavirus hub. Brilliant, thank you. Question again up for um, Scotland, uh, Joe Jackson at the National Library of Scotland. Um, again, it's back to pigeons. Um, and I think this, this could be for Karen and AD yet again about. Um, the decisions you're using to, to judge whether to put up the netting versus the aesthetics of, of that decision. Have you got any thoughts on that? And how well, you do you want to go first, Karen? Yeah. <laughs> well, 
it is always a balance between the architecture of the space, whether it can be seen from the public, um, Hampton Court being a scheduled monument. It also involves um, discussions, detailed discussions with Historic England. Um, so it's balancing up all of those things with the risk to the potential damage caused by the pigeons being there. So we kind of have to balance every space. Most of our back of house spaces, we've already put pigeon netting where we can. So the current discussions are um, able to um, basically looking at if there are any other opportunities for either netting or potentially spikes as well, which we try to avoid if we can. But the best way to manage pigeons is, of course, to stop them being there in the first place. So if we can put anything additional in place, we, dis we will discuss it with Historic England and our building curators. Um, yeah, yeah I absolutely helpful. agree with that. Um, I mean, I, I, it's, it's a while ago now, but when I worked at the Natural History Museum, David might remember, we looked at the possibility of using magnets to attach pigeon netting to, to frames, metal frames, because obviously the listed status. But, what, but I don't know about Karen at Hampton Court, what I have noted, what we have noticed, is because we don't have the uh, normal people, and you can imagine the, the front of the museum where the the gardens are there's loads of people there there's ice cream and there's chocolate and all the rest of it um we've not got the food there so the pigeons have gone away um there was somebody in them um, on the news the other day complaining about the pigeons in trafalgar square actually were getting quite vicious because they're so desperate <laughs> um i haven't heard of any pigeons actually attacking security at the moment but i think it's only a matter of time but we don't actually have the, pe the pigeon problem at the moment. Although we did have a pigeon that flew in through an open window, mm. which obviously opened because of the natural air conditioning that we have in the, in the building. Um, and that's, that's problematic because we can't get to that part of the roof at the moment to actually put netting on it. Mm. Okay. Ours is the opposite. We're finding more pigeons because they're having, they're basically, there aren't any visitors to scare them away. So, because we don't have food in the courtyards anyway, they're not normally attracted to that. They're more attracted to kind of roosting points and, um, and because we don't have visitors disturbing them, they're, they're moving in if given half the chance. Clearly we don't have as terrifying visitors as you have. <laughs> <laughs> moving on there. Um, a couple of questions again for Karen. Um, on, on sort of operational value, uh, how do you measure your your dust levels? And that comes from Kaylee Spring. We use microscope slides, which are carefully cleaned and put out in various locations around the galleries, and they're set locations. We tend to we look at them once a month throughout the year, and then average up the data on the slides. We look at percentage area coverage and the type of dust, so the the size and the particles, and and working out um, what it's made of, basically. So. We do it as a, a standard and have a KPI that we look at under normal circumstances. And this data will help us to, to, to see where our dust problems are. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question for you, Karen, is from Peniel Richards, who's asking what sort of uh, conservation heating radiators do you use? We have a combination of different things at Hampton Court. Um, we have part of our apartments, uh, we have heating from the building management system, so they're inbuilt radiators, underfloor heating. Um, the standalone ones, we tend to use ceramic radiators, ceramic fin radiators, um, which are controlled using either a MECO or a Hanwell humidistat. Okay, thank you. Um, one question more for you, Karen, before I move back to Helen. Don't worry, there's lots of questions for you, Helen. Um, uh, have you noticed any difference in the type or amount of pests caught in traps in more hidden locations rather than the more open locations during lockdown? We're finding in the less hidden areas less things like um, damp indicators and we that's presumably because there's more airflow to the traps normally they're hidden away kind of in dark corners because they're slightly more open we're finding less silverfish and um, kind of woodworm and things, not woodworm, sorry, um, woodlouse and things like that. Um, we have found more damp indicators on the more hidden traps. So that's our, that's our main indication. We're not seeing a huge difference in anything else though at the moment. Uh, thank you. Uh, on to Helen, a, a question here from Derek Brain. Hi Derek. Um, can you get non-black wool uh, blackout material? Oh, do you mean for the um the film projector, um, it, 
I'm sure that they can. I'm not sure that that was something that had been identified as being a potential issue when the installation went in. It may have been something that was missed. Um, I'm in a slightly odd position now because I'm not on staff at Tate anymore. So I was brought in um, for a certain number of days to help out. So actually having gone off on sabbatical last July, I was coming into the galleries um, almost slightly blind. So the, the artworks and the collections have moved around. So I was looking at them purely from a materials based viewpoint. Um, and when we got to that particular room and we were looking at the artworks, I noticed that the curtains seemed to be felt, but it wasn't obvious whether it was synthetic felt or whether it was um, natural felt. Either way, um, whether it was the curtains as a food source or just the fact that it was a darkened area that wasn't being disturbed, it seemed to be the most problematic part of the whole of Tate Modern in, in terms of moth activity. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here, uh, I think possibly Helen, this would be a good one for you as well. Or oh, please, Karen and Aidy. This is from Sandy Allison up here in Fife again. Um, with, with the amount of closed showrooms and galleries that you're, you're experiencing and the reduced lighting and fewer people, do you think you can say whether you're seeing more life cycles for moth or not? Or is it a bit early to say that? From Tate's point of view, I don't think we'd be able to get that level of detail from the monitoring because we had, because of the way things were, because um, because of, there was a staff uh, recruitment freeze and Mark joined us remotely and I was on contract, we were only able to make these targeted visits during lockdown. Um, I anticipate that if I'd still been on staff, I'd have been in much more frequently. So we were very, very focused. I don't think we'll be able to get that level of detail about life cycles. Um, I think there's probably multiple life cycles anyway in, the, in, in terms of the moths. Okay. Well, 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 I, I think Helen's probably right. Well, I know you're right. I mean, the other thing I think to bear in mind, well, of course you're right, Helen, um, is um, we're, we're in a position at the BM where some of the HVAC systems have been turned off, which was a decision made to uh, make sure that we have the, the mechanical engineer capacity to, to work it. So, I mean, I had a laugh with the head of conservation and collections care the other day. If we could turn all the lights off, um, bring all the temperatures down to nothing, I mean, that would be the perfect situation to keep the IPM under control. Um, but obviously, we can't do that. Um, certainly, for my risk rating concept, we know where we have the vulnerable material. Um, and what we've done is we've sent people in to go and check areas and in fact our security teams have actually been very good because they have to patrol the site. Um, the cleaning uh, contract company have actually gone in and peeked into the showcases and looked at some of the monitors they can see. And then equally as I said our pest control subcontractor sub has actually been going in regularly um, and in actual fact by the end of the week I should have the last quarter IPM data from Safeguard Pest Control and I'll be able to compare it with the lifetime last year uh, to actually determine that. But in answer to the question, like uh, everyone else, we have very few resources to do the normal level of pest monitoring we want. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not in hindsight, we need to put that in the corporate risk activity to say in the event this happens again, sorry, I'm moving a hearing aid, that we need to make sure less people are furloughed or not, I don't really know. I mean, this is, this is at directorate at trustee level. But um, I think it's a question of, at the end of all this, if there ever is an end, there needs to be a huge evaluation of what did we actually manage to do um, and what did we not do and what was the impact of not being able to do it. Okay, I've just got a couple more questions and I realise that Jane's gonna come down on me in a minute. Um, Question for Karen, quick fire here. How do you deal with your death watch beetle? We monitor and we try and we lower the relative humidity in the space to try and lower the moisture content of the wood. And if it's caused by a potential leak, we repair the roof. Um, okay. We don't tend to use any other type of treatment unless it's a significant infestation, which we haven't got. Okay. Uh, another one, probably for you as well, Karen. Um, Using contract cleaners, do you have the same people every time? And if not, how do you make sure that your procedures are followed? That's probably, everybody can chip in there, I think, with your experience. 
we're at HRP Hampton Court we're lucky that we do have the same cleaners and we carry out an awful lot of training with them normally monthly training with them to ensure that they both know the area the problem areas from a pest perspective and also that they follow the procedures the poor lady who was is still cleaning Hampton Court there's one person coming in so it reduced from a team of about six down to one so and she's cleaning all of the state departments and is doing a fabulous job so Okay. So at, Tate, um, at Tate's store in London, there is a dedicated cleaner for Tate's store and the idea behind that was that, that that cleaner can then be trained to be able to work in the store areas as well as the office and kitchen areas. Um, and in the main galleries, um, I can't speak for how consistent the actual teams are, but we have our preventive conservation has a very good working relationship with the cleaning manager. Um, and so um, the cleaners will go in and they'll clean in the public spaces without our, um, any um, any need for any conservative involvement but if they need to clean behind barriers um, or around artworks that will be done in collaboration with art handlers or conservators. Okay final question. Very um, quickly. Yeah. Um, the top things you'll be adding to your next iteration of your emergency plans based on what you've learned. That's me sort of paraphrasing. Go. Well, on my database, I put that additional column, which was added in a spare row of the column that I put in, which was um, the, the, I don't know what the word is. Is this a collection that we need to be particularly aware of in the event of further lockdown or any form of salvage operation? Um, and this is primarily from the, 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 the risk of it being damaged by uh, insect damage or whatever but also to do with access and things like that so some of the collection spaces obviously are more difficult to access than others but as a member of the salvage team um, one of the things that I'm actually going on on Friday to do with a colleague of mine is to make sure that all the spill kits and spill bins are fully stocked and the salvage cupboard is ready and um, as part of an additional precaution, we use wheelie bins, large wheelie bins full of salvage equipment, which you can wheel and you can bump downstairs in case you don't want to use the lift because of the COVID regulations. So I think we'll have one to, of the things I've got to do is to do that. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. Okay. Back to you, Jane, but thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you all very much to our, our first group of presenters. Um, our second group of papers is um, does have a little bit of a lockdown focus but is very much look, still looking at there is still normal IPM going on. So I am delighted to start with Sam Higgs who is a preventive conservator for historic royal palaces and is going to um, Give us a bit more detail, I think, on something that Karen touched on. So she's going to be talking about managing and controlling the common clothes moth at Hampton Court Palace, a 10 year study. Over to you, Sam. Thanks, Jane. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about a project I've been leading on for over 10 years to manage and control common clothes moth at Hampton Court. We first reported on the high level of common clothes moth in Henry VIII's Great Watching Chamber at Hampton Court Palace and our attempts to control it at the Pest Odyssey back in 2011. This presentation will give you some background detail on what we were doing at the time and what progress we've made since. At the heart of, of the most visited area of Hampton Court Palace lies Henry VIII's Great Watching Chamber. Lined with some of the most important Tudor tapestries in England, this room has 160 square metres of textiles vulnerable to the common clothes moth. Through our comprehensive IPM programme, we first detected common clothes moth Tineola bisseliella in the Great Watching Chamber in 2004. The following years saw a gradual increase in the numbers caught. Initially, we thought we had controlled the increase through increased housekeeping and localised insecticidal treatments. However, it became evident in 2009, after the trial of the highly effective AF demidiamond pheromone trap, that contrary to the visual inspections and blander trap results, that the moth population was not decreasing and was now endemic to the room. Although adult moths had been found on the tapestries in the course of our regular monitoring by both preventive and textile conservators, there was no evidence of moth damage to any of the tapestries in the Great Watching Chamber, many of which had been removed for treatment in the previous three years. 
investigations to pinpoint the location of the moth activity in the room through extensive pheromone monitoring, inspections and dust sampling found that the accumulated dust full of skin, hair and fibres throughout the floor void was the source. In 2011, I reported that we were using Exosex, a, a mating disruption product, in an attempt to bring down the number of clothes moth, which were increasing in numbers year on year. The use of the product was to allow us time to plan the next step in controlling the clothes moth population. The Great Watching Chamber is at the heart of Henry VIII's apartments, and these Tudor apartments are the most visited area of Hampton Court. It is used extensively for filming, functions and education, and until this year, we were open 363 days a year, so closing the most popular area for, ne for any lengthy interventive works would require extensive planning. Although initial results from using Exosex were good, it became evident at the end of 2012, after a review with the supplier, that the product was not working efficiently for us, as we were not able to place the dispensers under the floor where the majority of the moths were breeding. You can see in the graph that the numbers were high in 2009, with a slight decrease in 2010 when Exosex was first trialled partway through the season. This was followed by a marked decrease in 2011. By 2012, the moths had come back. During these years, there was extensive work happening under the floors around the palace, and the one thing that was noted in each area was that the accumulated dust under the floor was directly below the gaps between the floorboards. It hadn't spread far from where it fell, and was usually only a very small amount. So in early 2013, we had another plan to try and alleviate the growing moth population in the Great Watching Chamber. To avoid lifting the floor due to the cost and disruption involved, we chose to apply a residual insecticide between the gaps in the floorboards. We used a silicon dioxide based desiccant dust. As many of you will know, this works by absorbing oils and fats from the, cuticles, from the cuticle of the insect's exoskeleton, causing the insect to dry out and die. Its sharp edges are abrasive, scratching at their surface, helping to speed up the process. So any moths passing over this dust would be killed. And to stop any more protein rich dust getting through the gaps and covering the insecticide, which would make it less effective, we sealed the gaps with an expanding foam tape. So the good news was that in the following four years, the number of moths caught on traps more than halved, which you can see in the graph. However, in 2017, during our annual pest check of the tapestries, for the first time in over 10 years of monitoring for moths, we found evidence of a very low level of moth activity on an area of newly restored galloon on a tapestry. The reason we believe this to have occurred is that the new galloon is 100% wool, which, as we know, is highly nutritious for moths unlike the original historic threads, which are also wool and had gone untouched. So because the moths were now found to potentially be putting this historically important collection of tapestries at risk, we obtained agreement from our conservator-led Agents of Decay Board to lift the entire 19th century floor to enable us to properly clean out the void to ensure the risk to the collection was removed. Um, the Agents of Decay Board was set up by our Head of Conservation and Collections Care Kate Frame, with the support from HRP's Executive Board in 2007. This enables CCC to have a platform where we can raise the profile of our work, specify collections risk, and agree and get backing for the implementation of conservative proposed mitigation measures, including funding for these from senior managers from all disciplines across the organisation. So the work began the work to lift the floor began in January 2019. The plan was to carry out the work whilst maintaining visitor access and actively promoting the work that we were doing. Unfortunately, on opening up, we discovered asbestos. Although this was, this was not wholly unexpected, a joint decision was made between our operations, maintenance, surveyors, health and safety staff and ourselves to continue with the work. Um, this allowed for the extra time it would take and the restricted access to the two main rooms in the Tudor apartments. The Great Watching Chamber was sealed in an asbestos enclosure. The asbestos removal company constructed a timber frame within the room and enclosed it in red polythene sheeting, taping it to the walls with high tack tape where permitted 
and a combination of high-tack and low-tack tape where the walls were more delicate. Air sampling carried out by an independent contractor during the initial opening up revealed that there were no asbestos fibres in the air and providing the asbestos in the void was not disturbed, our own in-house carpenters with the correct PPE and under the supervision of an asbestos removal company were able to remove the floorboards. We used our on-site carpenter to lift the boards rather than the asbestos company as the 19th century boards needed to be lifted carefully so that they could be accurately reinstated again afterwards. As you can see in the photos, they carried out repairs to the boards as they lifted them. The boards were then vacuumed and sprayed down by the asbestos company to decontaminate them before they were taken out of the great watching chamber and stored systematically next door in the great hall. Once the carpenters removed all the boards, the asbestos company then thoroughly cleaned out the void of asbestos, dust, and hopefully moth eggs and larvae, after which the containment tent was removed. You can see in these photos how much dust had built up under the floor over the years. It was over 10 centimetres deep in places, and the asbestos company removed just over four tonnes of debris from the void, most of which was dust, plenty for the moths to have lived on for many years. After the clean out, we again applied an insecticidal powder to the entire void. The benefit of this insecticide is that it will remain effective almost indefinitely if it's kept dry and undisturbed. So should any moths find their way back into the void, they won't live long. Before relaying the floorboards, a Tyvek membrane was attached over the joists. The boards were then relayed with an expanding foam tape between, between each board to fill the gaps. This double layer is unlikely to stop any moths or larvae passing through, as they will always find a small gap. It is actually to stop the build-up of dust under the floor on which the moth larvae were feeding and thriving. So whilst all this work was going on in the room, we used the time to ensure the tapestries were also free from pests before we rehung them. Our preference is normally to freeze objects that have or are suspected of having insect pests, and we have two freezers available on site, a large walk-in freezer and a smaller chest freezer for this. But with eight tapestries and four armorials, the largest tapestry being over eight metres by four metres, they were too large for our on-site freezer. Um, so we decided to have them heat treated close by by Thermolignum, who are, who are now called um, Integrated Contamination Management. The main reason we chose this treatment is the speed at which it works. The tapestries only took 24 hours at 55 degrees centigrade to treat versus three weeks in a freezer, which meant these important and valuable tapestries were off site for a very short period. The tapestries were treated in two batches and were brought safely back on site pest free. In all, the work to remove the flooring, the cleaning, the application of insecticide and relaying of the floor took just over eight weeks. So the results. Um, you can see from the graph that for the second year in a row since the treatment, moth numbers have decreased and they are now at their lowest since we started pheromone monitoring in 2009. At the peak, we averaged 125 moths per trap in a month. Last year, our highest average catch was five. And when bearing in mind that this room is open display and one of the busiest in the palace, this low number is manageable. Great Watching Chamber now has amongst the lowest moth catches we find in the palace. Going forward, as I'm sure you all know, the best way of controlling moths is vacuuming. And with our thorough established conservation cleaning regime, we can continue to keep the dust in the room to minimal levels and are comforted to know that it won't build up under the floor. And if any moths get into the void below the floor, we know the insecticide will do its job. We will continue the intense pheromone monitoring of the space for the next two years to see how effective the treatment has been and whether we are keeping the moths at bay. We will then reduce the quantity of traps in the space to keep, the, to keep a general overview of the moth numbers to ensure they don't start to rise again. We have been fortunate that despite the coronavirus causing us to close our doors, as Karen has previously mentioned, we do have a member of preventive conservation team that is able to attend site and carry out general conservation cleaning of the palaces and checking of traps. But with, this, with, but with the number of moths now down to manageable levels, and the potential for a buildup of dust removed, I'm confident that this issue is finally resolved. 
Thank you for listening. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Sam. What a wonderful success story. <laughs> Thank you. So our second presentation in this group is from Amy Crossman, who's an independent conservator currently based in South Wales, uh, who's going to talk to us about activities to support IPM during lockdown. So it's all yours, Amy, when you're ready. Can you hear me? We can now. Yeah, that's perfect. I can only see you though, yeah, so far. Yeah. Um, can you the share screen? You should be able to do that, I hope. It's not coming up on my screen. Oh, that's very odd. Um, no, I can only share my screen, not your screen. That is very peculiar. If I do, oh, hold on. Me there, lovely. Yeah, spot on. Hello, uh, I'm Amy and I'm an independent conservator specialising in collections care. Um, I'd like to welcome you to my presentation, Activities to Support Integrated Pest Management During Lockdown. Enforced restrictions on travel and movement imposed due to COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in organisations have, having to re adapt and rethink their approach to integrated pest management and collections care strategies without little warning. Resources are readily available to promote and support the IPM pr um, practitioner, namely the What's Eating Your Collections website and the Chantry Library. It is hoped that this presentation inspires you to check out and interact with the valuable resources, as well as using lockdown as an opportunity to investigate IPM more deeply. Two vital resources that are available are the What's Eating Your Collections website available online and the Chantry Library, both of which are readily available and easily accessed. Under lockdown conditions, these resources are ever more significant and the current crisis provides an opportunity for them to be explored, with the potential for IPM practices becoming embedded further into our daily work upon our physical return to collections. Lockdown provides the ideal conditions to refresh and update IPM knowledge using these resources, building resilience and sustainability into IPM practice. In this presentation, I aim to give you an overview of the work I have managed to achieve under lockdown conditions. It will include providing an overview of the reference database system, where we are now and its future direction, and the production of an annotated IPM subject bibliography for the Chantry Library. Over the past 10 years and in collaboration with David Pinniger, I have been working on developing an IPM reference database system as a method of tracing the very large amounts of IPM references across a wide range of publications, some of which are not easily discovered or tracked down. This literature database is generously hosted on the What's Eating Your Collections website. This is how the front end user interface currently looks. The What's Eating Your Collection website contains three portals, each taking the user through to a different area of the website. An identify and solve area, a pest recording area, and the database of IM, IPM references, which is today's topic of discussion. The What's Eating Your Collection website is going to be undergoing a revamp over the coming months, and as it is currently hosted through 
uh, flash player, a technology which is no longer supported. Um, I should point out a number of organisations have helped fund this project and it presents the ideal opportunity to review the database, how it works and where we'd like to go with it. The purpose of the literature database is to have all re relevant IPM related literature readily available in one place to be used as an, as an effective tool to drill down, refine and focus literature searches. Before looking at the literature database and, its, and as an introduction to it, this is a summary of the information we are collecting, along with a summary of some of the statistics. We have a total of 516 references on the database. And due to the large amounts of vast data we are collecting, and in order to effectively manage that data, the references have been divided into the following subheadings or categories. Um, there are 10 um, categories, six languages represented, and five types of publication have been identified. There are approximately 30 more recently identified um, references that I need to, to add. Some of these references are historic in nature and other, others are from the relatively recent past. The earliest reference on the database dates to 1699 with Allen's philosophical transactions giving some account of the prevalent undertakings, studies and labours of the ingenious in many parts of the world which is the first reference to directly cite insects in a domestic setting, which is the closest that we have to a cultural heritage setting. We have references right up to the current day. Upon entering the database of IPM references portal, the literature reference database will appear. References are arranged according to the Harvard system and there are additional fields of subject, category, type of publication and language. Where a reference has an ISSN number or an ISBN, these are also included. Initially, the references were abstracted from some of the key IPM publications, such as Florian's 1997 and um, Pinniger's 2001 publications. These have since been supplemented with references from many additional sources. Currently, the only way to search the database is it in the front end user interfaces by using the category function to bring up a list of references that relate to that topic. The screenshot we are currently looking at shows all of the references on the database in alphanumeric order. The database is also available to download in Excel spreadsheet format by clicking on the Excel um, icon in the top right hand corner of the screen, which provides data, provides access to the data in its raw form. By simply selecting an icon from the category bar at the top of the page, the display changes to show only references from that category. An Excel spreadsheet was chosen as, the, as an effective method to manage and coordinate the references, as Excel is straightforward to use and unlikely to be superseded. It is also a useful program for managing and making sense of a large amount of data. New references are easily inserted as a new record in a new row, um, an example of which is highlighted here, Tom's 2000, uh, Tom Strang 2001's article on principles of heat disinfestation. At the moment, one person maintains the database with time dedicated to the process on a monthly basis, and the Excel spreadsheet is imported to the website on an annual basis although this last occurred in 2018 and now needs revisiting. As the, resources, as the resource grows and in conjunction with the website revamp, this may change. We would like the function of being able to add references directly to the online version. We would also like your input too. So if you're interested in being involved in assisting with the database upkeep and maintenance, then email me and uh, I'll be in touch with you. Um, my contact details will appear towards the end of the presentation. So earlier this year, I was approached to write an IPM bibliography to add to the Chantry Library's growing series of subject bibliographies. 
The Chantry Library is a collection of publications, grey literature and archives concerned with historic conservation, with a strong focus on paper and book conservation. The Chantry Library has taken various guises since its inception, originally as the, the Library of the Institute of Paper Conservation. The Oxford Conservation Consortium became the new owner of the Chantry Library in 2016, and is continue, delighted to continue the work of maintaining a resource used by conservators, conservation scientists, librarians and archivists. David Pinnegar gifted his reference collection to the Chantry Library in 2019 and much of the literature cited on the database can be found in their holdings. Although the Chantry Library is linked to the Institute of Conservation, you do not need to be an ICON member to access this resource. So the Chantry Library produce a series of annotated bibliographies which aim to support the work of conservators. The bibliographies include an evaluation to inform readers of the relevance and the accuracy of the sources cited. There are five previously published bibliographies on a number of subjects and the IPM subject bibliography was launched on the 30th of June 2020 and is the sixth in the series. It is the first to venture into the field of preventive conservation. So there are a total of 20 key references cited for the IPM, for the Chantry Library IPM subject bibliography. These are a mixture of books, articles, conference proceedings and online resources. Literature was selected on its relevance and applicability to IPM today and the reference database was used as the starting point for sourcing, this, for sourcing these key articles and was the driver behind the bibliography. Of the 20 references selected for the bibliography and for the purposes of this presentation, I have chosen to focus on these three references as they each individually have made a significant contribution to the shaping of the IPM landscape and added to our knowledge database. The first key reference is Childs and Pinniger's 1994 article, Insect Trapping in Museums and Historic Houses, presented at the IIC's Triennial Conference in Ottawa. Surprisingly, since trapping is one of the main activities IPM, it is one of the few articles dedicated to the process it contextualizes the trapping process and its practicality and significance within a wider preventive conservation strategy. Whilst this article mainly examines the types of traps, including those with pheromone attractants, which are safe for use within collection areas, it also briefly touches on the complexities of trap data interpretation. The second reference I've chosen is Doyle et al's 20 2007 article, Risk Zones for IPM, From Concept to Implementation. It is the first documented case study of the introduction of risk zones as a preventive tool to assess the level of risk pest, the level of risk pest posed to collections, offering a program flexible enough to respond to the changing demands and new threats. It is the re first reference to recognize that individual buildings have their own pest populations living on organic matter within voids rather than in the collections themselves. Identification of high to low areas of risk within the building allowed for resources to be prioritised, adapted and targeted as appropriate. And the final reference is Tom Strang's 2001 article, Principles of Heat Disinfestation. It puts forward the scientific basis for the application of heat for disinfestation. He provides a persuasive argument in a cohesive ev evidence-based form of the um, fundamental concepts of heat disinfestation. It considers the effects of heat on both organism and object. Um, the key for this article is to demonstrate that heat with controlled humidity has no effect on sensitive wood as Tom is um, demonstrating in the, in the photograph. 
The concept of relative risk is introduced as a method of assessing the risk of damage through heat treatment in which the, tr the risk of damage through heat treatment is determined to be so small as to be immeasurable. Um, Nigel Blade's presentation following, following this presentation will be discussing um, this thermo treat thermolignum treatment. Um, and further to the bibliography's publication in June, a review will appear at a, of it in the August edition of Icon News. And it's available for download from the um, Chantry Library website. So the next steps. Firstly, we would like to encourage as many people as possible to interact and use the database. The more feedback we have on how in users interact with it, then the more user friendly we can make it. Are there any additional categories you would like to add that um, you, you think would be useful for you? Um, or, or is there any other data you think we should be capturing? We would like more people to contribute references for inclusion on the database. And we like um, contributions in languages other than English. And we just like general information on how the, you think the, the resource can be developed. And the Chantry Library are also keen to um, receive some feedback. Um, they would like to know how, the, how they can support the wider conservation community. Um, so they want to know if you have any ideas on resources that the library could develop to support conservation and collection care activities. Um, any ideas for further subjects for bibliographies? And how they can support the wider IPM community. If you'd like to contact any of us, our contact details or are available. Um, and um, the details for accessing the database and the Chantry Library. And finally, I'd just like to thank the following individuals and organisations, and I'd like to th thank you all for listening. And as a final comment, we really would like people to interact with the database. So please access it and use it, and also read the bibliography. Thank you very much indeed, Amy. You've been an absolute stalwart of the website in maintaining that database, and I'm delighted that it's now going to get a wider audience through the Chantry Library bibliography. Um, I'm sure that we can put the, that link onto the Pest Odyssey website after this oh, afternoon's programme. So we'll make sure that that's there so that people can find it. Um, but equally, that's an advantage of recording the talks. You can go back and watch Amy again and get that, that reference. <clears throat> so, uh, segueing beautifully, we now have uh, Nigel Blades. There we go. I'll just get him open. Who is the Preventive Conservation Advisor (brackets) Environment for the National Trust? And Nigel is going to talk about the work they've been doing on the the treatment, formerly known as thermolignum. Uh, looking at the acoustic emission monitoring of furniture response to that particular treatment. So over to you, Nigel. Thank you very much, Jane. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Jane? Oh. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Not yet. And you're a little bit quiet as well, Nigel. That's the solution. That's that perfect. Yes, that's, that's better. Back up. <laughs> Thank you. I put that out of the way to drink a cup of tea earlier, but now I need to speak. So uh, back on. Right. Uh, share screen. Let's go and see if that works. And we want to go with, we'll go with, can you see my screen now? Not yet. Not yet. No. Okay. Let's try this one here. Yes, that's looking hopeful. That's now. more promising. Yes, there we Let's go. go. Perfect. Okay, going full screen. Just bear with me a moment. There we go. So that's full screen now, and I hope everyone can see that okay. 
Um, so this talk is about using a technique called acoustic emission. Incidentally, as it turned out, uh, for what we wanted to learn about IPM, uh, incidentally, it came about we were able to find something useful and interesting about IPM treatment and about the warm air treatment process, formerly known as thermolignum, but as has been previously mentioned, uh, it's now Integrated Contamination Management, ICM, who are, I gather, up and trading again, back in business after uh, a bit of a lockdown during the COVID-19 crisis. So I'm going to tell you a bit about this uh, research we carried out back in 2017-18, and it was something I presented previously to the National Trust English Heritage Hampton Historic Royal Palaces Joint Research Seminar. So some of you may have heard this before, but perhaps not uh, many of you, I think, given we've got uh, 300 or so people nearly on the, uh, on the meeting today. Okay, so I'd just like to say thank you very much, uh, incidentally, to uh, Nico Vilka and to Rebecca Sawyer at ICM, who were very open and interested in the research and facilitated the work we wanted to do with them with the heat uh, warm air treatment chamber. Okay, so a little bit of background. So this work all came about uh, during the resurfacing uh, and representation project at Knoll House in Seven Oaks. Uh, which took place over five years, just completed in 2019. And if you don't know Knoll House, it's uh, one of the National Trust's historic houses. It has uh, a collection which has been largely unchanged in the rooms and locations for some 300 years. And it's had historically a pretty uh, ropey environment, shall we say, and the little graph down at the bottom shows you the humidity, which really ranges around about 60 to 80% over the year for the last 300 years. So you can imagine that's not entirely good for the collection. And what we've been doing in the last five years is putting in a conservation heating solution to improve the environment amongst many other things and improvements and repairs to the building fabric. But with carrying out this installation of conservation heating, we wanted to know what will be the physical response or changes in the collection after they've lived in this damp environment for such a long period of time how would they adapt to being in more what we might call beneficial or, or reasonable museum conditions where the humidity is kept below 60% and maybe down to 45, 50% at times? So in order to investigate that, uh, we looked around at various possibilities and the technique which um, was sort of coming to the fore in the last few years is called acoustic emission. And this is a, a non-destructive testing technique from the engineering field. It's used actually on all sorts of engineering structures, such as bridges, uh, aeroframes and things like that for aircraft uh, to understand structural integrity and any structural degradation that may have occurred to the, the material. Um, it's been adapted in the last few years by a team in Poland at the Polish Academy of Sciences, led by Roman Kozlowski, uh, with Marcin Straszecki and also Lukas Bratas. Uh, they've adapted this technique for studying uh, historic items of wood and how does, do items of wood respond to the environment uh, when we change uh, relative humidity and temperature, and particularly relative humidity. So this technique, uh, which has been developed and established now really for the, the conservation field, offered us some good opportunities to understand what was going on with Knoll or what was likely to happen with the collection at Knoll as we moved objects from their baseline 60 to 80% humidity to a more controlled 45, 65 RH type of band. So in order to do that, uh, we entered into a project with the team at uh, Krakow and we selected uh, some high profile objects from Knoll. Uh, you can see in the photo here, the Gold Suites table and the two tour shares in the picture. Uh, one, of the one of the tour shares is monitored and part of the table and they're fitted with acoustic emission microphones that can detect very small uh, sound emissions that occur when there are structural changes, i.e. Uh, developments or popping of the cells in the wood itself. And they t the team in Poland have developed a calibration method which can then extrapolate the acoustic energy that they detect uh, and relate that to crack length propagation in an idealized or standardized piece of timber. So it's possible to say from the level of acoustic emission you get what this might equate to in terms of the extension of a, a small crack in millimeters and fractions of millimeters. 
So there's a, a basis for using this technique to quantify physical response in objects. And we use this at NOL to study the changes in environment and principally the physical response of the objects as they move from this uh, damper environment to this drier environment. Now that's not the main story here, so I'm not going to dwell on that, but happily the conditions look to be okay and the object looked to be okay and the responses were well within any margins of safety. But what was also evident and what you might not be surprised at at all from objects in the environment they've had is that a lot of the uh, furniture at Knoll is subject to wood borer infestation as you can see in the images here with the piles of frass in particular on the left very clear evidence of that and it was also found during the acoustic emission study that some of the objects we were looking at had evidence too of uh, woodworm infestation and this is something our research colleagues in uh, Poland have come across before and you can see in the graph here uh, there's some data showing the temperature dependence of uh, acoustic emission from objects with uh, woodworm anobium punctatum infestation and you can see there's a clear sort of uh, rise in infestation activity and acoustic activity uh, with temperature so that accords with our expectation of how these uh, insects are likely to behave that as the conditions become warmer they can become more energetic and move around and eat more within the, the timber itself. So that was evident from other objects they'd studied and it was interesting to note that this was present on the objects at uh, Knoll as well. It was something which confounded part of our other study though we were able to find a workaround for that as well. So that was two elements of the project coming together, the study of the physical damage of the table and the um, woodworm presence and infestation. And we were very much aware of these infestation issues and as part of the Knoll project there was a program to treat the entire furniture collection in the house uh, it, using the humidity controlled warm air thermal lignum formally but now ICM process and we had the uh, portable facility uh, come over from Brussels and this van uh, stayed at Knoll for about four days and we had about three loads of furniture passed through the van which treated almost entirely the collection at Knoll. So that went through this controlled RH heat treatment uh, with the uh, van environment uh, stabilized at about 50-55% RH as the temperature was raised to 55 degrees centigrade where it needs to stay at a core temperature for about one hour of overnight treatment. Um, and then the objects are, are then unloaded the following day and then we loaded another day's uh, load later in the afternoon and sort of carried on and got through about 400 objects. So it's a very efficient process and it's widely used and considered safe for most objects. And as we heard from uh, the talk earlier from Sam, we're using uh, this form of treatment for uh, tapestries and it's used for furniture and in our case, quite highly decorated furniture as some of the examples of at Knoll. But what we were quite interested in was, could we combine the treatment uh, we were carrying out using the warm air method with a study of uh, the response of the furniture during treatment uh, using the acoustic emission uh, methodology that we were using at Knoll for other purposes. So that was our uh, final sort of part of the acoustic emission study. And with uh, the assistance of, uh, of Nico and uh, Rebecca, we were able to uh, 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 take our furniture to the facility in West London in Chiswick uh, for the thermal lignol warm air treatment and here you can see the uh, gold suite table which was placed within the chamber uh, and you can also see the two tall chairs and there are other objects in there as well um, and they were then monitored as you can see from the cables snaking out through the wood door uh, to the uh, acoustic emission equipment which our Polish colleagues set up uh, on the day here uh, outside the chamber to monitor the uh, responses of the object during treatment. So that treatment took place in early 2018 and this shows you the uh, the temperature and humidity experienced by the objects during treatment. So you can see that the RH was maintained at sort of a mid-range value uh, in the low 50% RH range and then you've got the uh, the ambient uh, room or chamber temperature rising up on the red line uh, and then the core temperature as measured in a, a core block of wood you can see clearly goes up to 55 and above just over degrees centigrade and it's actually maintained there for two and a half hours so it exceeds the, uh, the requirements of the treatment for a minimum of one hour. So you can see that treatment uh, cycle with the stable RH. So it's very interesting to know what happened to the objects during that treatment from the acoustic emission.
and the objects were uh, on a retrieval or removal from the chamber were examined immediately by our furniture conservator John Hartley who is uh, a long-standing sort of a, a conservator working with the National Trust and John's seen and studied these objects in great detail before so he knows a lot about their their history about their faults and their quirks so he was actually able to examine them post that treatment and happily confirmed that there was no evidence of any flaking or material lost from these uh, highly decorated uh, gilt objects so they were physically unchanged by the process of, uh, of the warm air treatment which was reassuring so what did the acoustic commission tell us about that treatment well this table summarizes our findings from the acoustic emission uh, study during the uh, chamber treatment and you can see the top line of the table shows you the acoustic emission experienced during the warm air treatment on those two objects uh, so you can see the conditions are summarized there for the environment temperature and humidity and then the number of acoustic emission events are counted and you can see there's around about 40 events for both objects and then the uh, total energy involved acoustic emission energy is integrated from uh, the, the total response of the object and that gives an arbitrary unit response of about just over 20,000 arbitrary units of energy and using the calibration the Polish research team have developed that can be now converted into a crack length propagation in a piece of timber uh, which equates to <coughs> excuse me around about 0 0.04 millimeters a year so uh, a very small amount of crack length propagation and you can compare that with the objects at rest as it were in the environments when they were in the historic environment at Knoll and then latterly in the studio store environment uh, where you see uh, acoustic emission which is lower so three to five thousand one two to three two to five thousand units of acoustic energy emissions and uh, responses of 0 0.00 uh, 8 in one case 0 0.01014 0 0 0.002 millimeters per year as their crack length propagation so even smaller values so the values during the treatment are elevated above at rest but they are still very small values and you should bear that in mind when you look at the example from the National Museum of Krakow where a uh, wardrobe was put through this uh, acoustic monitoring process under relatively dry humidities and that gave a acoustic uh, emission energy of over 350,000 arbitrary units equating to about 0.6 millimeter crack length propagation in a year and even that was considered by the conservator at Krakow to be reasonably acceptable and we're looking at values from the warm air treatment which are an order of magnitude below that so we would conclude I think safely from this that the treatment process is a safe one and the quantitation of the acoustic emission shows that there's very little response from the objects. The response that we did see uh, was predominantly during the heating up as you might expect and in the Torcher in particular during the cooling down phase. Uh, so that's when the most acoustic emissions seem to take place at the steady state condition where the temperature and humidity were both maintained at the high 55 degrees centigrade level and around 50 percent rh uh, the the acoustic emission was almost negligible during that phase it was only when things were changing that we saw a larger response and just to show you what's happened after that this graph is plotted in the american date format so you've got uh, from uh, January 2016 ranging up to July of 2018 and you'll see that uh, the after treatment in the third kind of shaded area of the graph if you look at the the black bars which represent the acoustic energy once the objects were returned to the um, uh, gallery at Knoll you can see that actually there is an absolutely negligible response uh, from the objects post treatment. So you've got very considerable uh, size of the bars in acoustic energy due to the uh, woodworm activity in the earlier part of the graph and a very negligible response and activity from early 2018 onwards after the treatment. So that suggests that the treatment was also highly effective and that any of the woodworm larvae that were active have now been killed by the treatment. So just in conclusion then, we'd say that the Acoustic emission activity occurring during the heating and cooling phases of treatment uh, was, was where the most activity was, but it was still minimal, and it was minimal when the steady high temperature was maintained. 
the torch air had almost all of its acoustic emission activity during the cooling, uh, maybe because it's a more dense and solid piece of wood, possibly that might be why it responds in that way. And the overall acoustic emission that the objects exhibited during treatment was equivalent to about three to five years response at rest, if you like, in the uncontrolled environment at null. So um, a relatively small amount of additional response is generated um, and that you know, is still at a very low level, below a level which would ever be considered damage. And no observable damage was noted by the furniture conservator when they carried out their uh, condition check after the treatment. And finally, uh, post-treatment, the no, there was no woodworm acoustic emission response observed. So only the normal environmental acoustic emission, we'd gone back to that very low level of what was normal for response to RH. Uh, so that suggested that the treatment was highly effective and that the uh, larvae activity was eradicated. So to follow on from Amy's slide, uh, Amy talked about uh, Tom Strang demonstrating the issue of uh, would, you, would you see damage in, in wood if you have a humidity controlled heat treatment process. Here we've actually found a technique that can measure and quantify uh, a change in wood but we can also say that we see no damage being caused to the objects either. So um, that's been a useful bit of research to do and I'd like to thank our colleagues in Poland uh, for their collaboration on this which is a very successful and enjoyable collaboration and colleagues at Knoll House as part of the uh, st studio and the project uh, team who uh, did a lot of this work and facilitated a lot of this research and I know some people, uh, Suvon and Martha I think are on the, uh, on the meeting today. So thank you very much. Thank you Nigel, that's a, a really interesting presentation on a very different field of, of work that we normally encounter in, in IPM um, and it's very encouraging to know that the warm air treatment is absolutely effective, which we all believed it to be, but uh, that's a nice piece of, of evidence. Um, and, and fascinating to see in some respects how much uh, acoustic energy that uh, larvae generate within furniture. So thank you, Nigel. So you. we move to questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Hello there, thank you. Um, we've got quite a few questions for the panel, so I'll go through. Um, first of all, for Sam, there's a lot of interest in your floorboards. Um, and a, a couple of questions that overlap, so I, I might stick a couple together. Can you, first of all, for Victoria Stevens, tell us a little bit about tieback and any effect it's had? on your RH because of the breath any sort of breathability issues? Have you noticed any changes? Uh, no, we haven't. Um, the, the floor underneath the great watching chamber is actually a, a solid stone vaulted ceiling. Um, so there's no, well, if there is any, there's very little um, sort of effect from below anyway. Um, so no, I don't think the uh, Tyvek has had any influence. Um, there's been a couple of questions about the insecticides you use, because I think at the first point you sh mentioned a silicon dioxide for using between the floorboards, yeah. but when you treat it underneath, um, a lot of people are, are quite curious about what you used for that. <laughs> uh, so the first time we used, uh, in 2013, we used agro dust, uh, but that's uh, no longer available to us. Um, so for the second, um, approach in 2019, we actually used kill germs, uh, vasa, diatomaceous earth. Okay, thank you. Um, Hilary at NT wants to know a little bit more about the expandable foam that you used in between afterwards. This is the last floorboard question, don't worry. Yeah, um, that is called a uh, Compraband. Um, I can't remember the name of the manufacturer. Um, but it's, uh, it's used extensively in the building trade. It's usually used, it was actually recommended by our carpenters, um, and it's used usually around um, timber framed windows to seal gaps. Um, I think in new builds, in our, particularly in our house, we've got it um, just under the soffits as well, and it just gently expands um, to fill the gap. Um, so in our case, it was perfect for stopping any dust getting down. Okay, thank you. Um... Finally, uh, Madeline was asking, uh, do you move your traps around uh, within the rooms 
periodically in HRP or do they stay static? Uh, they stay sa static. Um, in the Great Watching Chamber, uh, we have six traps in the room anyway, because um, we were trying to work out where in the room um, the moths were actually coming from. Um, so they're sort of spread at a distance of about five metres anyway. Um, and a bit like Helen was saying, we can't put them in the centre of the room because that's where the public are. Um, and the rest of the palace, we just use a sort of key area. Um, I think ideally you want them about a metre or two off the ground. So if we can, we can put them on fireplaces. If not, it tends to be in or near a fireplace or, or near a vulnerable object. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to a few questions for Amy. There's been a lot of very positive comments about the, the work that's gone on to putting this together. So a, a lot of thanks to you, Amy. Um, Christian um, Bars has just made a comment that um, some of the 2019 IPM conference papers from Stockholm aren't available yet, with a few others. Um, is that something that is going to be looked at? Are you there, Amy? Can you hear me, Amy? Sorry, Noel, I missed that. Oh, sorry, Amy. We're just talking about um, bibliography, and um, Christian Bars has just pointed out that the contributions from the 2019 IPM conference in Stockholm aren't yet in in the the resource. Is there a a wish to get that uploaded? So, um, they are on the back end view the view that i use but um as i said in the presentation they get updated and, and imported up to the onto the database on an annual basis they were last the import last happened in 2018 so it's due to happen again but i'm hoping to do it in conjunction with the um the revamp of the the what's eating your collections website so it will it will happen um mm -hmm. Okay. And I do have them on the web on my end. It's just not been uploaded to the website yet. Right, and we've also got um, uh, an offer from Rachel at Museum Pest Group, um, who would be happy to submit their bibliography. So maybe there's a bit of a chat there, and also a question from her saying, "Have you considered using a platform like Zotero so that others can submit?" Or is this a closed process? What are your thoughts there? Um, so in conjunction with the, the revamp of the website, it's something that I think that we need to be looking at. Um, we would like other people to contribute, but it might be that there are a select few people who, um, who are administra administrators. Um, but it's something that we're going to look at and be considering over the coming months. Okay, thank you. Um, Nigel, we'll move on for a question for you. Again from Christian, a, a question um, pointing out that um, there's a positive cor correlation between temperature and uh, anobium punctatum activity and has there been any work to look at evidence of a similar correlation between the punctatum activity and RH or moisture content. Um, it was very interesting. Yeah, we saw that correlation. Um, I don't know if there's been a lot of other investigation of this. I mean, there are other researchers using acoustic emission to specifically study insects. So they, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, use a slightly different technique than we were using. But there are other ways they can look at this and also the humidity response. But I, I don't know of anything specific on that subject myself. Maybe David can. David's put his hand up, so maybe yes, he can very, tell us. Very useful, Nigel. Very nice presentation. There's been a lot of work in the past on acoustic emission, particularly in store products. And one of the problems has been that often the noise from the objects is greater than the noise from the insects producing, particularly as you've shown, when you warm something up, you get an increase in energy activity. Uh, so I, I really don't know the answer. Somebody probably could do a literature search on this to find out um, if there is any more in recent information out there. Yeah. 
Okay. The technology, as you've shown, is so much better now than it was some years ago. Yeah. And, and one thing about the acoustic emission technique developed in Poland is it uses a, an anti-correlation method. So you always have two microphones and two objects in proximity being monitored. And any signal detected on both microphones is treated as background noise. So it allows you to filter out things which are in the background because you might pick up the noise of people walking past or the machinery, uh, but you can get rid of all of that using this anti-correlation technique and just detect what's going on in the object. I know that uh, a number of people in uh, warmer countries are very interested in termite detection and it's spreading up into Europe anyway. So this may be a very, very useful early warning for termite activity. Be warned. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, a question uh, from one of our panelists, Helen. Um, can you tell us anything about the, the painful bit of uh, acoustic emissions, which is how much does it cost? Um, and how, how available is it? Um, it's it's getting to the point where there are sort of systems people can buy and use for themselves. But and Hanwell did used to have a system they marketed called Woodwatch, and there are other commercial systems you can buy as well. Um, it's still it's still on the cusp of being a research technique, though it's fair to say. And uh, particularly where we what we were trying to do at Noel was fairly non-standard so it did involve um, the researchers from Poland coming over to set the equipment up specifically and um, interpret all of the data and results for us so that there, it was still very much a specialist activity I'd say for us we were not at the point where we could do this for ourselves and the overall cost was in it was probably of the order of you know, the whole project which includes everything that was monitored in, in Noel was probably of the order of £15,000 for that research project. But uh, uh, So the acoustic emission element for IPM was a relatively small element of, of that cost. Thank you. Um, let me see, there's a few mixed up little questions here. Back to Sam. Um, did you find XSX uh, to be ineffective in the end? Or well, can you talk a little bit about the, the change in approach there? Um, yeah, I mean, it was, we had the, um, the company Exosect uh, come on site and evaluate it for us. Um, and like I said, because um, we couldn't get the pheromone dispensers under the floor uh, where they were breeding, um, they said that actually in our case, it wasn't working for us, but I know they have had, um, they've used it effectively elsewhere. Um, but yeah, for for us, no, it wasn't working. Okay, um, there's a there's been a couple of general questions uh, for panelists about alternatives to constrain. Does anybody want to give um, their solution to what you've been using for a, a water-based permethrin? Because oh, I need to be on screen. I can give you um, a, it's a Adrian here. Sorry, Dave. After you, AD. Okay. Um, diatomous earth, uh, um, agro dust, and things like that are quite good. Um, my only concern with them, as I said in the comments, is from a health and safety point of view, they are quite challenging because they are respiratory irritants. Um, and what you tend to find is that I'm not saying any companies that I've used, the companies tend, tend to be over liberal about splodging it all over the place um, rather than putting it in targeted areas um, and you also have to be aware that when people are opening a space which has the diatomus or the agrodust or whatever in it um, that you need to make sure that people know that because often people open a cupboard or showcase and may not be aware so you need to make sure that it's properly managed because it is a significant respiratory uh, concern. Okay. Um, question also is about an, an alternative to the um, constrained permethrin. David. Yeah, I mean there are, there are a number of other water-based microemulsions which are on the market. The rider is that constrained was specifically produced and registered by Bob Child for use for anybody in heritage who had the training to use it, uh, ready to use and very safe. Um, the other products that may be registered may not be so freely available for use by conservators. 
you may need a professional professional pest control applicator but what might happen is uh, as you may know uh, some of you that uh, David Loughlin has taken from Sentinel has taken over histrionics and is looking at uh, either replacements or alternative or resupply of constraints so I think you need to watch that space okay thank you um, Can I just chip in here, Amy? Um, sorry, Mel. Um, the other thing, has anybody, we've successfully used transfluthrin to kill moths. Um, has anybody else used that effectively? I mean, the concern we have, one of the procedures we have at the BM is that we don't apply a pesticide to an actual object, which is one of our own in-house conservation regulations. So we tend to be dealing with the, the space and dealing with the actual object by freezing. I'll answer that one. Um, Transfluthrin is a vapour insecticide, uh, as you know, Edie, and only works in enclosed spaces. You really need quite a high concentration. It's quite effective against the adult insects, but you need much higher levels for the larvae. And some conservators do not want to expose their objects to a vapour insecticide. So it's a question of risk evaluation and also cost. It's quite expensive for large volumes. Anybody else got any comments? I'd be pleased to hear them. Um, just a few more. I think we've got a couple of minutes, Jane, don't we? Yep, just a couple. Go ahead, Mel. Right. Um, uh, here's a comment from Amy from Ariel Jeweller down in Warpeth, um saying, uh, how about a type of IPM wiki? There's something to keep you busy, Amy, if you're not already. Uh, I think we're all trying to keep Amy very busy this afternoon, from what I can see. Um, a little question for Sam. Um, again, everybody's interested in your floorboards. Uh, do you know the specific membrane, the Tyvek membrane that was used to attach to the joists? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, our health and safety advisor specified that it had to be, it had to meet some fire regulation. I can't remember exactly which it was, um, but the one that we settled on was a uh, Tyvek fire curb, which is, um, I'm not sure how, how new it is, but it actually um, it self extinguishes um, if it catches fire. Um, so that's why we went for that one. Okay, thank you. I think I'll end with a final question. I'm sorry if we haven't been able to get to you all, but maybe the panel will be able to sift through later and get in touch with you. Um, one final question from Sarah Potter for all panellists with um, the opening up and a, a wish potentially to increase airflow in buildings. Um, do you see any issues and is this a route that your institution is going to go down? Yeah, one of the projects that's worked on at the moment with our mechanical engineers is we're looking at airflow around the British Museum. We're also looking at the route that the public might take and also um, windows that may be opened uh, more than the normal uh, process. Also looking at doors that may have to be opened to funnel air around the museum. Uh, we've looked at it from an environmental point of view with respect to object safety and the effectiveness of showcases, which may not be particularly well sealed, and therefore the showcases tend to rely on the ambient environment of the gallery to maintain their tight parameters. Um, from an IPM point of view, a bit like um, we've been talking about before, we do dust monitoring in certain areas of the British Museum. We've already been investigating increased organic matter in certain galleries. And those of you who know the BM know the Greek and Roman galleries upstairs um, where a lot of plant matter has ended up on the showcases which I've um, been uh, working with conservation on and we've worked out that's caused by air funneling through from the west uh, staircase which is acting as a kind of a chimney so it's a question really of a decision as to who where the resources are to make good additional cleaning and what risk there is to the collection and what sort of mitigation we may have to do, and also what risks we're prepared to take. For the National Trust, I think we're very interested in that as well. Um, and 
obviously there is a, a role in ventilation in buildings now to make them more safe for people in terms of COVID-19 infection and you know we are trying to when we do open buildings to uh, have more ventilation for them and in the houses that may well be um, not over and above what they would do in summer in any case which is often they will have the entrance and exit doors open and they may also open the um, windows from time to time so we will probably carry on on that basis I know ventilation's in the news again today and there's quite a few uh, bits of discussion about the World Health Organization changing their emphasis on how the infection can be spread but I'd be interested from David and others just to get your take on how risky you think it is for pest insects flying in through windows and what times of year that might be worse? Uh, yeah, that's a, a, a question I'm often asked and certainly in the uh, late spring, certainly carpet beetles will fly in through open windows. The, all the evidence is that webbing clothes moth, which its natural home is probably in South Africa, at the moment does not overwinter and live outdoors in birds nests in the UK at least and northern Europe but with the changing climate who knows that may increase. There was also a question earlier about um, vodka beetle, brown carpet beetle, Atogenus smyrnophi. We've definitely got evidence that in urban areas that will fly quite readily from one museum to another. And we've seen that in the South Kensington area and, and now in other areas out, out at Kew, it can actually seem to spread in the, in the warmer weather by flying. So there, there is a possible risk. However, I had to say that most insects I find on windowsills are those trying to get out, not trying to get in. So <laughs> yeah, I can't really answer that definitively. But thank you. Um, and just really one final question. It's probably at, at Jane when you're when you're doing this summing up. There's been a lot of interest in whether these presentations and talks will be available and where they will be available. So I'm sure you'll do that um, in closing, Jane. But I'll hand back to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mel. So our um, we have uh, two more presentations and potentially a tiny bit of time after them to have some questions. So I'm really delighted that um, we have Joe Jackson with us today, who is a preventive conservation intern for the National Library of Scotland. We don't very often get um, students or interns prepared to present, so we're very excited that, that Joe is with us. And Joe is going to be talking about ascertaining the cause of localised pest building up in collection areas. So it's all yours, Joe. Hi, everyone. Uh, just give me two seconds. There we go. All right. Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. Um, thanks for letting me speak today. Uh, I just wanted to spend some time talking about some of the work I've been doing uh, for the past 10 months uh, at the National Library of Scotland. So um, my name's Joe Jackson, I'm the Preventive Conservation Intern at the National Library. Um, Scotland made possible through uh, ICON and the Works Foundation. Uh, I've been responsible for integrated pest management at all National Library sites, uh, as well as other facets that you might associate with preventive conservation, such as environmental monitoring, uh, salvage uh, operations, rehousing, and, uh, and so on. So when I started, uh, one of the first projects I began was to review the current IPM scheme at the time, uh, which focused mainly on the, the George IV Library building, uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, to give some context for you, the National Library has four main collection storage sites, uh, two of them in, being in Glasgow, uh, Kirk and Tillock and Kelvin Hall, which are both mainly used to store moving image material. 
uh, and two in Edinburgh, uh, the George the Fourth Bridge and the Causeway side. Um, previously, uh, prior to my internship, checks were mainly conducted at George the Fourth uh, Bridge Library as sort of a, a priority. Um, it wasn't necessarily a standardised approach, as it was essentially uh, the conservation technician's responsibility, who um, at the time also obviously had other uh, responsibilities that maybe came above that. It was sort of more an ad hoc thing. Uh, they were mainly conducted every uh, once every six months, so compiling historical data from that uh, became potentially quite problematic. <clears throat> so. I began uh, by standardizing the IPM scheme across all the sites. Uh, I started performing checks every two months in an effort to gain uh, reliable historical data, um, as well as attempting to gain insight into any uh, seasonal differences in pest presence at each site. Uh, any changes that were then recorded uh, and any um, historical data uh, put into a report every quarter. Uh, as the months went on, uh, a small number of areas across uh, all sites began to show small pockets of pest propagation. Uh, this, become, this became pr particularly prevalent at uh, George the Fourth Bridge. Uh, so we responded by initially placing new traps nearby those areas where we were seeing those sort of uh, small build-ups uh, in pests. Uh, and seeing whether it was sort of a localised group or maybe if it was a larger, more widespread issue. Uh, we were also uh, recording the environmental uh, conditions in these areas, uh, which eventually actually began to highlight uh, certain issues. So I think it's important to note that uh, the reason for placing these traps in uh, these particular areas in the first place was due to the presence of uh, a moss-like substance that we found, which I'll show you on the next slide. Uh, we initially thought it to be mould, but actually um, under a microscope it just seems like a, an accumulation of dirt. Uh, and this was in a particular area at George the Fourth Bridge uh, along what was a, what's an exterior wall. Uh, initially it was deemed that it was due to the fact that it was an exterior wall that potentially there was a high uh, level of RH uh, coming through into the space and causing uh, an attractive spot for insects to propagate. I'll just show you the, the area that we're seeing. So as you can see it sort of looks almost like paint splatter but it was actually seemingly uh, this buildup of dirt or dust that was accumulating. Uh, and then you can see the traps that we were uh, depositing as well. Um, it's deemed that this uh, has been actually cleaned away now, but we are still monitoring this area um, to see if the, uh, it comes back essentially. But uh, one thing that was particularly interesting is the traps that we were putting down in this area, particularly along, um, I'll just use my last point it out, uh, around this area where the exterior wall is, being a considerable uh, a build up in the number of uh, book lice. Uh, and this began, I think, after the first round of checks, we we're experiencing around uh, 20 or so on each trap. Uh, and shortly after that number, on the two months check later, uh, we were, that shot up to about 49. Uh, and then we've documented a considerable increase since. So you can see here's a map of the um, areas that we are uh, currently monitoring in the specific area. Uh, we're seeing a considerable increase in the number of uh, certain types of book lice in opposite ends of the stack. So we're seeing uh, a large amount of lepinotis in this area and then bustrocophilia down here. Um, we're not sure why that is, whether the, there's any um, research that's been done on specific types of uh, book lice uh, propagating in certain areas. It'd be really good to hear if anybody's uh, done any sort of research in regards to that. Um, but we began, we began to uh, test the wall essentially running along here uh, for any moisture content. And in, when we started to, to discuss it with the states, they essentially said uh, they're very, it's very unlikely that um, be any moisture coming through that wall because it's around six foot thick 
um, and lo and behold, we checked it and there's absolutely no moisture content. So we began to explore other uh, avenues. So we began to look at the ventilation in this space. Uh, so at the end of this stack here, there is a ventilation port, uh, but we discovered that it is intermittently blowing air down all down here. And this is a fair distance. This is around maybe 30 feet of uh, stack. So the amount of air that's actually getting down to this area is fairly minimal. Uh, and even at this end, uh, the amount of air variance is very, very, very minimal as well. Uh, so we began to place uh, USB loggers all down this stack at varying different heights. So we would have one on the top of the stack and then one at the bottom uh, to see what sort of uh, temperature variance and uh, relative humidity variance that we were getting as well. Uh, and more traps were placed in this affected area to make sure that we weren't getting uh, any pests moving around. And uh, we actually found that they're all sort of staying in this area. So it's very much sort of a microclimate that we're experiencing in this area. Uh, this is some of the uh, environmental data that we were collecting as well. Um, so this is from the bottom of the stack. Uh, and as you can see, it's fairly steady, um, but extremely high. So we've got around maximum of 68.5 uh, uh, relative humidity percentage uh, and a relatively low uh, average uh, temperature. But then on the top, we're experiencing a, a slightly lower average of around 60. 60.1% relative humidity. So there is quite a variance, uh, even just between uh, six foot of stack uh, between the ventilation of that area. So we kind of decided between the estates, co uh, colleagues and I, that this was definitely an issue and it has now been uh, determined to be a, a considerable problem and it's been hopefully fixed. Uh, throughout lockdown and hopefully uh, into reopening. Um, but I mean, I went in yesterday uh, back to the, li um, to the library for the first time, sorry, on Monday even, uh, and we did the resumption survey and there is still a considerable increase in the number of uh, book lice that we're experiencing in that area. Uh, and in terms of the state of the collection, we are hoping to do a survey um, as soon as we get back, essentially. Uh, sort of a more bespoke survey in this particular area, which actually um, contains mainly deposited collections. So there is sort of a workaround that needs to be done in regards to how much work can be done in regards to rehousing, how much of that collection can we spend time and potentially money rehousing if it's uh, only a deposit, although we do have a, a duty of care to those collections. Uh, so in terms of the COVID restrictions that we've had, um, obviously Monday was the first time I've actually been on site. Uh, luckily I was able to change the traps before, um, before I left, uh, which was probably a really good thing because what we're experiencing on is, you won't be able to maybe see it um, on this photo, but all the dots are essentially book lice and clumps of book lice. So what we seem to be getting is a large number of these book lice will be actually eating uh, the book lice already on the trap. So we end up getting a large uh, accumulation. And the more, it seems like the more book lice on the trap, the big, the larger of an attractor it is for others to uh, come, which is great in terms of they're not on the collections, but it's also a bit of a nightmare for determining the amount of book lice in that area because it just means that the they're trying to eat their mates um, and not necessarily given us an idea of uh, whether they're moving in and around that area. Um, so yeah, I was unable to uh, check the uh, pest traps, but I went in on Monday and I think we counted around 64 and that's an increase of uh, two and a Minutes half months. Uh, so we put the surveys on hold and essentially uh, we're going to re be restarting those uh, straight away. Uh, as soon as we get back. Uh, and we're thinking about maybe the fact that um, lack of movement in the storage areas uh, has possibly affected the number of pest presents and that they've not maybe uh, uh, been disturbed quite as much. So in summary, uh, the cause uh, was determined to be 
uh, a lack of consistent ventilation, which has now been addressed by the estate staff. Survey is going to be conducted to ascertain whether damage uh, from pests has been occurred in the collection areas. Uh, environmental monitoring is going to continue and possibly inform a PhD uh, study into microclimates in the collection storage spaces. And the environmental conditions uh, throughout lockdown are continuing to be assessed. But yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that was all right. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Joe. That was a, a really interesting presentation about a, a good practical piece of work. So very well done. And we'll be interested to hear um, how it continues. So thank Cheers, you. Thank you. And then um, again, beautifully segueing. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Michael Nellis, who is the membership manager for ICON. Um, you may not realise the Pest Odyssey group itself was formed after the Pest Odyssey 10 years later conference in 2011. Um, and we have bumbled along as a steering group and um, had this annual meeting for a little while, but we needed to have a bit more legitimacy. So we have become an ICON network. Um, and some of you may not be that familiar with them. So Michael is going to explain to us what networks are and why they're brilliant. So over to you, Michael. Yes, thank you so much, Jane. Um, well, as Jane mentioned, I'm here to explain a bit more about ICON because I realize some of you may not know what a network is and how you can get involved even if you're not an ICON member. So as a first step, I will share my screen if I can. Can everyone see my PowerPoint here? Yeah, that's brilliant, Michael. Okay, is it showing, do I need to minimize it or something? Can everyone see it? There we uh, are. Yeah, that's it. Okay, good. So um, thank you for asking me to speak. Um, so firstly, for those of you who might not know, what is ICON? Um, ICON is a professional body. We're the professional body for conservators. We exist to bring together those who have a passion for cultural heritage, and that can be conservators of all types. So we have conservators from a wide diversity of specialisms who all work towards the same objective, which is to ensure cultural heritage survives to be carried forward by the next generation. And we also campaign for not only enhanced standards of conservation, but also for conservation to be recognized at, at more political levels as well. We've been doing quite a bit of work in the pandemic um, to ensure that the needs of conservators were met. One of our core aims is to make sure that conservation is practiced to the highest quality standards possible. And some of the ways in which we do this, we have, uh, we're the only professional body that has accreditation for conservators. So we have the mark of, of quality standards there. Uh, and indeed a very rigorous code of conduct and professional standards uh, to which all ICON members are subject, trying to make sure we really deliver our message about what we mean by quality standards and conservation. Uh, we have nearly 2,500 members, mostly individuals, but quite a few organisations as well. They're based all over the world, and certainly since we started having more activities and events online, we've actually seen a great deal more international participation as well, as might even be reflected in the diversity of some of, our, of the people watching here today. They're not only conservators, uh, they're conservation scientists. We have lots of volunteers, people from all walks of life in the heritage sector, and indeed people who are just enthusiastic about arts and culture beyond that and, and want to get involved with us. So what is an ICON network? Now, first to preface this, I mentioned that ICON has a broad diversity of specialisms involved under our umbrella. We have 16 specialist groups, ranging from book and paper, to medals, to archeology, span to ethnography. And most of these date from the times when all of these different specialisms had their own groups. And in 2005, they all came together to form icons that we could speak with one voice for the sector. Over the years, it became apparent that because conservation is very much a moving field, there were all sorts of new specialisms growing up that weren't reflected in the diversity of, of those ICON networks. Uh, and so the ICON network model was devised to provide a home for some of these specialisms that were growing up underneath the ones that we had involved with us already. We have a group coming up, we had a group that came to the fore around conservation documentation, which affects everyone. We have contemporary art, which crosses all sorts of borders. Modern materials, which is of course distinct from that, but it tackles questions around how do we deal with plastics? How do we deal with, you know, concerning iPhones and things of that sort? 
And the network model was formed with a number of objectives in mind. The first was that it could well, it could lend itself quite well to those sorts of specialisms that crossed a few of those borders. So I mentioned contemporary art, which can involve a diversity of materials, uh, documentation, as I said, which affects everyone. Uh, dynamic objects is another one, and that could be anything from a wristwatch to a roller coaster to, you know, a pop-up book or something of that sort. Things that move. Um, there's a great uh, there's a great initiative to support these groups in reaching out into their networks and helping other helping us to attain their profile and ensure other people can engage with them. Um, we also saw an advantage in helping these groups in a way that was allied to our strategic plan. Uh, which is based around three core strands of advocacy, excellence, and engagement. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we could be flexible in helping people to focus on areas outside what we did traditionally um, and try new things. Um, and of course, there has to be some sort of oversight mechanism so they're subject to ratification by ICON's Board of Trustees. So, what has this got to do with Pest Odyssey? Well, as Jane said, Pest Odyssey was granted network status by ICON's Board of Trustees in 2017 which entitles Pest Odyssey to a number of ranges of support. Perhaps most prominently, website space on icon.org.uk, where we have group and networks pages, and you can have any number of things there. Those of you who are members might have seen the recent online webinar series, Conservation Together at Home, has a home there as well, under the book and paper group, who led that series. This is a, Pest Odyssey has, can have space there where they can post resources, they can post, you know, their committee minutes, they can, post articles of short lengths. Um, networks are also entitled to a degree of admin support in terms of setting up events and delivering them. Um, access to, to communication platforms. Uh, we have our internal systems for ICON members, ranging from e-bulletins on our iConnect system to our bi-monthly magazine, ICON News, to of course our website and social media platforms. And we also have external means of communication as well, our external newsletter, which I'll come on to in a moment. And also the network model importantly helps with cash flow and assists with potential funding for events and committee expenses in line with our established policies to make sure who volunteers for ICON has put in a pocket for doing so. So how do you stay in touch? There's a number of ways to stay in touch. Uh, as I mentioned, our iConnect bulletin for members, sorry, um, is all the latest news and events will go directly to your inbox along with our monthly roundup that reaches ICON members. We have an online community, uh, which is a series of chat rooms in which you can discuss ranges of things and all the groups have their own chat room there. We've also got more thematic chat rooms, one particularly about dealing with the impact of the pandemic, or dealing with collections care after lockdown, things of that sort. But of course, if you're not yet a member, there are still ways to stay involved. Uh, we have a new external newsletter, and I'll put the link up in the chat shortly. The newsletter will come out on a monthly basis and will profile a conservation project, give an insight into that sort of practice, give you a review of the upcoming events, um, some news and features to digest as well, to satisfy your interest in conservation and help you stay in the know with the sector. And of course, we've also got the traditional means of staying involved, such as social media. There's our Twitter handle there. We also have a Facebook presence that in fact was started by Karen all those years ago. Uh, and of course our ICON website where we have regular news features and other things of that sort. So there's a great diversity of ways to stay involved. What this means for people who want to stay involved with Pest Odyssey but perhaps aren't ICON members is if you sign up to the newsletter you'll always, always know the latest of what's happening with the group and what events are upcoming. And there'll be no need to rely on people forwarding things along or anything of that sort. You get those automatically on a monthly basis. So that's a bit about ICON and the means that you can stay in touch with us, what the network model is and where it came from. Uh, and so I'd be happy to have any questions or talk further about that uh, as might be warranted. And I'll simply post that link to our external newsletter in the chat presently. So that's it. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Um, we do have a couple of minutes that we could use for questions. Um, I did notice a thing came up in chat. There's a, um, a participant in Peru who was interested in how could they join ICON and I assume the easiest thing to do is just to go onto the ICON website. That's right, and I can post a link to that as well. Lovely. So... Come 
Thank you. Uh, Hi, Jane. Hi, Mel. So, do we have any questions for Joe and Michael? We've got a couple of questions for Joe so when far. Let's see if anything comes in for Michael. Um, uh, uh, Joe, I'm sure you're doing a lot of research at the moment, but um, are you seeing anybody or any institutions who are linking environmental data and pest data that you find interesting or useful? I haven't seen any, anybody doing it. I'm sure people are. Um, it's kind of been something I've tried to advocate since I started, really, because, I mean, that's where we've managed to find a lot of these issues. Um, but the problem we have at the minute is essentially in these areas where ventilation is potentially an issue, uh, a lot of our uh, Visala monitors uh, and detectors are about, maybe about six foot high. So they're detecting at the temperature and the relative humidity in the air at that height, but they're not necessarily accounting for lower, more uh, high percentage humidity areas at, at the bottom. Um, so it is definitely something we're keeping in mind and where necessarily uh, we're putting standalone loggers uh, to make sure there's actually uh, consistent readings. So if anybody else has got any, yeah. The com comment on that, I'm sure A.D. Doyle might come in on that because he's certainly been looking at the environment data and trapping data. One of the things I was really interested in was your species of book lice because it's known from previous work years ago that Lepinotus is very much a cooler, damper insect, whereas uh, Lipocellus bostracophila is definitely more related to uh, higher temperatures, but they both exist in very tiny microclimates, which we can't really measure right next to the walls or floors or in cracks. And a number of people have found this and they've got measurements up on the wall which don't bear any relationship to that in a crack in a floor. The other interesting point I would make is Dirictrix, which uh, is, has got very tiny wings. I admire your photograph you had there. This was first recognised, I think, by Darren Mann at, at Oxford in his museum some years ago. And since we've been looking for it, we found it nearly everywhere in small numbers. So those of you who are just looking at book flies through a hand lens may not notice you've actually got another species called Dirictrix, which has got tiny wings. Okay. So keep yeah, we've, we've managed to find, um, yeah, like you said, in very small numbers um, at most of our sites now. Um, we've mainly seen it at um, Kelvin Hall site where we've got um, HVAC system which relies on air coming out of the building so we're potentially thinking that it's actually in the air vents and coming into stores through that way but yeah it's, we have noticed it um, in very small numbers yeah. Can I, can I add a, a, a bit of a, a penny worth in here because one of the work that we've done and Dave knows about this is when we do our annual reports we combine the IPM data with the environmental data so um, under the assumption that the store maintains its environmental parameters, we can say that the store has complied with its environmental levels and therefore the pests that you would expect are consistent with that. But then equally, I mean, <clears throat> there are occasions where there's an inconsistency. And, and funny enough, one of the things I'm looking at when I go in on Friday, which will be the first time I've been back in for four months, is <clears throat> that we found silverfish and soakids in in a store which normally has no uh, certainly has no environmental problems and my suspicion there is that the air simply hasn't circulated because the room hasn't been used for four months um, equally the um, we're going to explore the corridor and the staircase outside because we've turned power off in terms of HVAC you get a, a form of condensation that might form on the walls, which you wouldn't normally get under normal operating. So it, it's a question really, I, I think you've got to sort of work out also, is that actually a risk? I know you've identified it as a problem. Um, and, and is that a risk? Obviously, if it spreads, it is a risk. But in terms of where your resources are, and, and we all know we've got limited resources, is it something you can just put to one side at the moment? Or is this something where you, you can see that this, this is moving? 
and also if you think it is like creeping across the floor whether or not as a precaution you move some of the collections away while you have no opportunity to do anything about it further yeah i mean especially um in terms of collections move uh we're fairly limited uh because this is all sort of on uh the um level eight floor uh where we keep manuscripts and deposits um and so I, I have suggested collections moves and it's been met with some resistance but um in terms of i think just reading the questions what christian said in regards to um about 30 seconds ago right altering the storage in terms of uh pulling that pulling the um blocks at the bottom out uh, we've got to consider where maybe more airflow might be good for that area but it might also mean that the bugs end up coming out and then into the rest of the collection space so it's balancing it between do we leave them at the back where they're potentially not on collections or are they end up going to spread uh, ended up going to spread elsewhere if we do wonderful thank you very much indeed joe huge thanks to mel for managing the questions it's not been a straightforward process i'm sure so thank you very much indeed um, and just a few closing thoughts uh, from me. So uh, we, I've had a quick look through the participants list and there are um, lots of you that I know and that I would normally spend time chatting with if this was a face-to-face -face meeting. So I'm sorry we haven't had that option, but there is one notable person missing this time. Um, and I think we should perhaps just Spare a thought for Bob Child, who has been enormously uh, formative in IPM in the UK and further afield, um, and certainly, as Dave Pinniger mentioned earlier, has given us one of our most used insecticides, which we know is safe for us and is generally safe for using in, in museum collections as well. So we miss Bob enormously, and if you didn't get a chance to read his obituary that was in Icon News earlier in the year, do go and look that out. Um, Amy very kindly mentioned uh, the website that I work on with Dave and she works on our database, What's Eating Your Collection, that we hope will be ready to go in its revamped form in October or thereabouts. So do keep your eyes out for that. Um, where you will find the talks, assuming the recording has worked, they will go onto YouTube and there will be a link both on the Pest Odyssey website and on the Pest Odyssey network page on the ICON website. Uh, Michael mentioned that um, there is now a Discord group um, which is available for ICON members, um, as I have yet to have a conversation with Michael about whether or not that is available for people who are not yet members of ICON, um, we have a groups IO group. Um, we use this as our steering group, as an email group. If you would like to join, this operates essentially anonymously. You just send an email to Pest Odyssey and it goes to everybody who's signed up. And it's an opportunity to chat and to share experience and to ask questions. So this is the link. It's on the uh, Pest Odyssey website. It will be. It should also be on the network page. So if you don't get it down here, don't worry. It, that will be available. Um, and as a final reminder, if you could, if you were in that. Um, email where you got to see people's email addresses where you shouldn't if I could remind you please to delete that after this meeting that would be fantastic so it only remains for me to thank all our speakers um, most of whom are from the steering group but not all of them um, and I hope that you've all found this an interesting and entertaining way to spend the afternoon um, I know I generally can't think of anything better to do than to talk about bugs so I hope you feel the same as well. So thank you, Aidy's popped up. Did you want to say something, Aidy? You're muted, you're muted. Aidy. I, want I wanted to say on behalf of the committee to thank you for all of your work for Pest Odyssey over the last year, and obviously the particular challenges that hosting this meeting has been. I, I think you've done an absolutely splendid job. Thank and um, 
without you, we, we wouldn't be uh, the committee and the resource that we are at the moment. So on behalf of everyone here and the committee, thank you very much. Thank you, Aidy. And sadly, it is now time for us to go because the, uh, the next book and paper Conservatives Together at Home webinar will be starting very soon. So thank you all very much for coming um, and we hope we'll see you again. Uh, and thank you for voting as well in the poll for the conference next year. That's been really helpful. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>